<clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, um, and welcome. I am James Herbert Williams, uh, Director of the School of Social Work at Arizona State University, and I would like to welcome you to uh, the uh, concluding uh, part of our uh, symposium, Social Work, White Supremacy, and Racial Justice. Um, I, in collaboration with uh, my colleagues, which you will shortly meet, um, have been uh, the, um, the power or the um, coordinator in the development of this symposium. So I want to welcome our first time attendees, and I want to welcome back um, uh, returning attendees who have uh, tuned in and followed us through these four uh, parts. So before we go into uh, before we go into the um, the specifics of today's presentation, I'd like to take a moment to recognize two sort of events that have occurred in the past couple of weeks uh, that I think are important to the work that we've been doing as part of this symposium. The first, I would like to acknowledge um, the, um, the shooting of Dante Wright. I think that the situation that happened in Minneapolis over the past week is indicative of why we are doing this work. And it also tells us that we still have a great deal of work to do. Um, so um, as we think about things such as Black Lives Matters and the understanding of the continual killing of young black men and black men in our society and in our country uh, by law enforcement and how we begin to address those sorts of issues. The second um, acknowledgement or event that I would like to uh, acknowledge and is the passing of a colleague of ours, Dr. Larry Davis uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. Larry was a dear friend of mine and a colleague to my um, uh, colleagues that again, you will be meeting shortly. Uh, but there was some distinguishing things about Larry's passing as um, in our profession. Larry was the founder of the Center for Race and Social Problems at the University of Pittsburgh and has been a leading thinker in our profession on issues of race and how um, the intersection of race and other issues in our society. So I want to acknowledge his passing and what a great, um, what a great uh, leader he was and a contributor to the profession of social work. So for today, we're going to be discussing part, we're going to be presenting part four of a four part series. As you will see, uh, part one sort of looked at our historical legacy. Uh, part two sort of allowed us to begin to reflect on the past and the present in our profession as related to race, uh, white supremacy and social justice and racial justice. Um, part three, uh, which my colleagues were talked about was about sort of envisioning what a future would look like in policy and practice to be anti-racist in the field of social work. And today you'll be hearing presentations uh, by uh, our colleagues around the country around strategies of how we can achieve racial justice in social work education. As I mentioned when I first uh, started, uh, this symposium has been a collaboration between four, uh, four uh, leaders in social work across the country and their universities as co-sponsors of this of this symposium. Uh, and that is my colleague, uh, Laura Abrams, who is the chair um, at um, the, the Luskin School at UCLA. Um, and then my uh, colleague, Dean Allen Detliff, who is the Dean of the University of Houston. And final, and obviously uh, our last but not least, of course, is our colleague, Sandra Crew, who is the Dean of Howard University. I will turn uh, the, podium, the podium over to Laura. Good morning, um, and thank you, James Herbert, for those acknowledgments. Um, I just wanted to remind us of how this, this series came about. Um, and really, the idea emerged after the murder of George Floyd uh, last May, um, along with, you know, following the, the killing of so many other black men and women who have died at the hands of law enforcement. 
And this pattern really, as James Herbert mentioned, has continued. Um, as we can see with what happened this week with Dante Wright in Minnesota, just 10 miles from the uh, trial of officer responsible for Mr. Floyd's death. And um, as the trial is set for closing arguments today and tomorrow, uh, we also begin the last of our four part series, knowing that there's so much that we can do as social workers. And we know there's been a lot of discussion about anti-racism um, but in the aftermath of these murders, social work was evoked in public discourse as a key talking point in policies related to perhaps a more humane alternative to policing, and maybe even a partner to the police. And a central question quickly emerged uh, in the Twitter sphere and elsewhere, is social work really situated as a humane alternative to policing? And can we be an alternative if we haven't reckon, reckoned with our own legacies of white supremacy, coercion and control over BIPOC communities? And relatedly, who's going to take control or the reins in the future of the direction of our profession? Where are we going to go from here? And as social work educators, and also in positions where we could feel like we could do something as deans and directors, we put our heads together and felt it's critical questions that need to be addressed, but not just by talking about it, you know, in meetings to each other, um, but by having a more public forum. And why not wait? Why not do this now? Uh, the scholarship is there. Uh, faculty and students are thinking about these issues, writing about these issues, talking about these issues. So why not have this symposium and have it be not one day, but all year? And why not do it for free and open to the public and put on YouTube? Um, and so this is why we had an open call um, and it has really exceeded all of our expectations in many ways. We got more people applying to present than we thought we would. Um, we've had more folks tuning in and downloading the videos. Um, and it's really kind of shown that there is this huge need, this need to understand where we've come from the work that's been done like by Dr. Davis, by the National Association of Black Social Workers, by allies and accomplices to get to this point, but also hearing from the newer generation of where do we wish to go in the future. Um, and I think one thing we've learned is that in the mission of anti-racism or toward racial justice, we can't be stagnant. So much has changed just in the last year that we've, we started this symposium and, and we've learned so much. So we continue to call for a critical consideration of the knowledges and the logics that drive our profession. We want this symposium to be the discourse that drives the future. And, and we hope that we are just one part of this larger movement because we know that this is not the end, but it's also not the beginning. And um, so I just wanna remind us that we're here in the service of making social work um, more, well, let's see, we're, we're here in the service of racial justice, knowing that social work can play a role in this movement. Thank you. And I will now pass the baton to my colleague, um, Dean Detlaff. <laughs> thank you, Laura. And thank you, James Herbert. And thank you, Sandra. This has been an amazing collaboration and I'm really grateful to be able to work with you and learn from each of you, not just over this last year, but um, in, in the work that will move forward and result from 
this symposium. Um, so as, as you heard James Herbert mention, you know, this symposium began last fall as a four part series, um, starting with the reflection on our past, where we looked at social work's historical legacy of racism and white supremacy. We then moved to part two in January, where we looked at addressing racism from within and some of the work that's been done within the social work profession to try to address and correct some of that history. And then last March, we moved to part three, where we turned our attention to the future to look at what an anti-racist future might look like, what social work's role in that future, and specifically, what would it take to get there? Um, because as we learned in part one, social work has its own very complicated history with racism that has been deeply ingrained into our profession since its very origins. Um, and then when we move forward and heard the presentations from part two, we saw that that racism and racist outcomes continue to exist in many of the systems where we as social workers practice. And this is because with few exceptions, we discussed in both part, parts one and part two, that social work as a profession hasn't done a very good job of acknowledging the racism that exists um, in our profession, not just in our history, but also in our present. And social work doesn't do a very good job in acknowledging our complicity in the racist outcomes that our systems produce. So in a large part, many of our sessions were designed to bring this into the open, um, to have discussions about this, um, partly as a means of accountability, because these discussions need to be public. Discussions about the racism in the social work profession, the racist outcomes that exist in our systems, the racist outcomes that we as social workers contribute to, those need to be public conversations as a means of accountability. So we began part three with questions to move us forward. What is the future we wish to see? What is the role of social work in that future? And does social work have the will and the courage to move from performance to action? And that question about moving from performance to action in the presentations that we heard in part three, we talked specifically about social work's complicity in working with carceral systems and the harm that those systems produce. So social work's role with the police specifically and with the child welfare system. And the need for social work to remove ourselves from those systems and begin to think about new ways, reimagining different ways of responding to the challenges we face in society without the need for the surveillance and punishment that the police, that the child welfare system use as tools to maintain the oppression of black and brown Americans. And we discussed that it's actually because of our social work values that we need, that say we need to fight against injustice, that we need to remove ourselves from those systems. Because it's those systems, specifically the police and the child welfare system, that are responsible for much of the injustice we see in society. Now in part four, we're going to continue our exploration of the future with a specific focus on the role of social work education in helping to shape that future that we wish to see. And for those of us who work in schools of social work, what is our role and what's our responsibility in educating the future generation of social workers to fight against injustice? And what are the tools and the strategies we need to use to get there? So these sessions that will be held over the next couple of days are particularly important because as social work educators, those of us who work in schools of social work, we need to be aligned in our work. We need to be prepared to do this work and we need to be clear in our goal. And that goal is liberation. Anything that falls short of that goal is maintaining the status quo. And we as social work educators need to unite against any kind of social work that falls short of that goal. So I'm excited to hear these presentations and I'm grateful for all of you being here today. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dean Crew. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, thank you, James Herbert, and thank you, Laura. Uh, for your uh, remarks and also the collaboration that I have experienced with you. I'm tasked with thinking about the way forward. And as I do that, I also reflect upon and grieve the continued daily assault on our humanity. Since we started the series, there have been many publicized losses and some not so publicized that have harmed our communities. 
The way forward calls for us to reflect upon and acknowledge their early contributions of social justice champions. So although we stand here today focused on making more changes, we must always acknowledge those that we stand upon their shoulders who have already invested in the change. And it's our responsibility to take it to the next level. Well, there have been many gifted and inspirational presentations. Their true value lies in our actions that follow. These actions include challenging the unjust practices that fall upon the lives of black and brown persons. The value of the symposium lies in our commitment to actualize the strategies for identifying injustice and eradication of the problem. Complex problems, as Alan has said. We have been complicit, as Laura has said, but we still have to dig deep to find the solutions to make the change. The actualization of change has many starting points. For some, it's an examination of our personal shortcomings, missed opportunities that we've had to make this more a just society. For others, it is something that they are just coming to grips with. And for others, you're ready to hit the streets. So we start at different points but yet equifinality will bring us together as we tackle the problems of racism, white, uh, white supremacy, and an unjust society. Our actions should include curricular changes that ensure the inclusion, inclusion of activism as we uh, focus on effective strategies to bring about change. And yes, the way forward includes establishing new networks. Some of these have been established through the, uh, this symposium. Focusing on the scholarship, finding commonalities among our uh, scholarship, and yes, challenging each other's scholarship. That is the beauty of the intellectualization of this problem. And we, yes, we must focus on decolonizing our scholarship. That resonated with me from one of the speakers because we too are victims of what the gold standard has led us to believe. The way forward includes greater engagement with those who are closest to the pain. Those who are closest to the pain. It requires that we sharpen our intellectual prowess as we think about the practice skills needed to triage the pain with effective prevention and intervention. We must understand that the years of oppression starts us at different starting points. Some of us are so enraged, we are so enraged that we know that our existence is inextricably linked to changing the world we live in. Others are simply seeking to survive the best way they know from a system that has been relentless and keeping its foot on their throats. We start at different points, but if we work together, the way forward can bring upon positive changes. Yes, slogans are our rallying cry, but slogans are dormant without frontline champions like yourself. And lastly, as we close this series, part four, we focus on the promise of the new generation of scholars that we have heard. We accept their leadership and their sage guidance and our collective efforts to address anti-racism and focus on radical social justice, including individual actions as well as movements. We really, pull together our fears of influence and work together for collective change. Each of you is a part of the way forward. Claim your space. And we are so grateful that we've had this opportunity to dialogue with you. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you very much, colleagues. 
it has been a pleasure to work with you on this symposium. And I and Sandra, you always provide such inspirational um, uh, uh, quotes and knowledge for us to think about as we move forward. Um, now, let's move on to series four. Um, again, um, my thanks to the colleagues for this wonderful work that they've done. Not only the work to do this symposium, as you heard from all three of them, the work that they're currently doing in their schools to make these types of changes and in their communities. So it's really not just an, an educational effort. It really is a, a strong community-based effort. So for part four today, we're going to be looking and exploring strategies for achieving racial justice and social work education. Over the next two days, we're gonna have 11 presentations by scholars around the country and the wonderful work that they're doing and the thoughtfulness that they're putting forth uh, to think about how do we re-vision uh, our, um, our educational process and how do we train our practitioners in our, in, in our profession to truly be sort of anti-racist social workers and focus on addressing social justice issues. Before we move into that, um, I uh, wanted, want to uh, sort of present to you a couple of sets of quotes that I think are very meaningful uh, for the work that we've been doing. One of my um, sort of authors that I've read over the years, and I still go back to, um, is Derek Bell. Derek Bell was a uh, nationally known and internationally known legal and race scholar um, and doing his time on the faculty at, at Harvard University. And so I've put together a couple of quotes I really would like to read to you that comes from Derek Bell because um, if you, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Derek Bell, but if you are not, I really would encourage you to go read uh, some of his writings um, from the early 90s on the area of race in this country and the things that we are not doing. Next slide. I would like to read one, a, couple, a couple of quotes to you. Um, Derek Bell indicates that slavery is an example of what white America has done. And he says, and I would say, and should be a constant reminder of what white America might do. The next quote that he has come from the book that is a really a book that I turn to quite a bit of uh, Faces at the Bottom of the Well. Next slide. Education leads to enlightenment. Enlightenment opens the way to empathy. Empathy foreshadows reform. I think um, he's in this quote, he talks about the need for education and how education is also a key. It's important that today that we're going to be talking about how we make these changes in social work education and what we want to do. Um, and then the next slide, and the last quote that I will say, um, and this comes from his book, again, Faces at the Bottom of the Well. Black people are the magical, are the magical faces at the bottom of society's well. Even the poorest whites, those who must live their lives only on a few level above, gain their self-esteem by gazing down on us. Surely they must know that their deliverance depend on letting down their ropes only by working together to escape, poss to escape possible over time. Many reach out, but most simply watch, mesmerize into maintaining their unspoken commitment to keeping us where we are and at whatever cost to them or to us. These quotes to me sort of gives a wonderful overview of not only where we've been in our society, but where we continue to be. And I think that the work that we've been doing over these four series have been very important to acknowledge those challenges that we're having within our profession and also as we begin to look forward. Next slide. Oh, sorry, let's go to the next one. I must have missed it. All right, here we are. So Alan mentioned some of these, and I think we want to, with the things that we hope will come from this, uh, from this four-point series is, what is the future that we wish to see in our profession of social work? Next. What role does social work play in the future of where we go to become an anti-racist uh, society? And 
as Alan mentioned earlier, does social work have the will and the courage to move from performance to action? And I think that's the challenge to all of us in our profession is that much of the work that we do is performative and that very little of it is really focused on action. And that's the, that's the challenge that the symposium is at. To. Next slide. So the goal over the next two days for what we're trying to do is we, in part four, we will examine strategies uh, to dismantle racism and white supremacy in social work education and practice. The sessions that you're going to hear over the next over the next two days uh, will lay the groundwork for what social work education and practice can be if we continue if we continue to change the structure of social work education. Next slide. So, in part four, we have four panels and four panels, and these panels are. The first panel that I'll be introducing in, in, a, few, in a few minutes, uh, Dismantling Anti-Racist Pedagogy in Social Work Education. Uh, the second panel this afternoon will be envisioning a future of social work, looking back, looking forward. And then tomorrow there'll be two panels with the first panel being whiteness and white supremacy, theories, education, and practice. And then our final panel on Friday and the final, uh, the final panel of the, of the symposium is anti-racist, anti-oppressive social work education and practice. Next slide. Just a few housekeeping. All panels will be available for later viewing on YouTube. Today's panels are also being broadcast on both YouTube and Facebook Live. Uh, we will have time for a few questions at the end of each panel. Please type your questions um, into Facebook. Uh, the chat will not be available, and we will entertain. We will make sure that we try to um, ask the panelists some of your questions, and we we'll try to get to most of your questions. Captions will be available in the recorded versions of these sessions that will that will live on YouTube well after the symposium is over. Uh, next slide. And again, um, as, as with many of these types of uh, endeavors, um, we have um, um, a number of people at, uh, both at UCLA and at the University of Houston that are working behind the scene to make sure that we are very seamless in the presentation we provide. And then a listing of the four institutions and the four schools of social work that has been uh, supportive and sponsoring this four part series. Uh, and my thanks again to Alan and to Laura and to Sandra uh, for their wonderful collaboration on this project. All right, so now I think we are ready to move into the first session. So the first, um, the first presentation uh, today is, okay, sorry, let me find it. Here we go. The first presentation today is gonna be presented by uh, Anna Nelson. Um, and the title of her presentation is Resistant Research, a Critical Trauma Theory to Uplift the Language of Those Unheard, Black, Indigenous, and Social Work Students of Color. Let me tell you briefly something about Anna before we move forward to her presentation. Um, Anna is a critical race scholar, educator, and macro practitioner. Um, she is a social work professor and PhD candidate. Um, um, Anna's uh, research interests are the, are the co-occurrence of exposure to racism, risk of oppression-based culture and collective trauma, and the simultaneous expression of cultural capital and community cultural wealth for Black, Indigenous, and social work students of color. Um, she was the recipient of the New Mexico uh, Educators' Equity Alliance um, Award in 2013, and uh, we look forward to your presentation and welcome, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Herbert Williams. And I wanna also express my gratitude and honor for being here uh, for all of this distinguished panelists and also for everyone who has assisted me in getting here, such as Dominique, Renia, and Panisse. So thank you so much. Uh, and so that was such a wonderful, warm welcome. I do wanna share a little bit about myself. So. I'm a mixed Latina, um, and I begin this work uh, in this dialogue with you all today 
really wanting to root it in relationship. And part of that is just knowing who is in, you know, in uh, community with you. So I'm a, you know, mixed Latina with my son who, um, so I'm a mother to a 21 year old, also biracial uh, young man who considers himself, names himself black. And so we have the um, beautiful dialogue in our home about our ethnicities and our, our, um, our experiences. And we also have strong critical dialogue about racism and other oppression, uh, particularly that my son endures. So with that, I, I also am bringing to you what is my heart's work, what is, you know, my corazón, right? This is, this is my life's work of um, noticing and, and honoring and uplifting the lived experiences with exposure to ethno-racial as well as other forms of trauma. Um, and at the same time, showing healing and hope and cultural capital and just this wealth of um, strength. Uh, that we learn from our communities, from our families, from our loved ones. So with that, I, I'm going to introduce today a, um, an emerging critical trauma theory, which is something I've been developing over an, a number of years. Uh, and my intent is to uplift the cultural capital and convey mattering for Black, Indigenous, Latine, and other social work students of color. So also because I begin this in relation, next slide please. Also, because I begin this in relationship with, hold on one second, guys, sorry. I thought I had this all figured out. <laughs> so, um, you know, it is, it is my honor and also I want to express a deep respect for the Indigenous First Nations peoples, the Puebloan peoples of New Mexico. So I'm here today presenting from Nuevo Mexico. So specifically um, the 23 tribes and pueblos uh, where I've had the honor to be a guest, to work, to raise my son um, and to live and learn. I also want to spend time honoring the forced labor given to these lands by indigenous pe peoples of Central America, Black, African, Chinese and Mexican peoples directly impacted by enslavement and colonization. To these peoples and their descendants, I acknowledge the grave injustices inflicted on you and recognize the indelible mark of your labor on the creation of the space where I gather with you today. This is just one small step to express my respect for the peoples of this land. All right, so why, why are we having this critical dialogue today? So. Um, for a long while now, I've been in um, community with my students as well as in classroom dialogue and hearing things such as I feel hopeless, like nothing will change, like nothing I can do to make a there's nothing I can do to make a difference. Um, something I really uh, resonate with is I feel so angry, I don't even have words, right? I can't even talk. Um, and then questions such as, Professor, how do we ever get here? Uh, I don't have a safe space to talk about this. Um, and in recent losses, I had a student begin, um, begin her class by saying, you know, my name is and my life matters, right? And I wanted to bring these words directly from students to share with you because I know as educators out there, you all are, are possibly experiencing the same thing um, and may feel at a loss as to how to create that emotionally and culturally safe space for students to express themselves in these ways. So what I'm sharing with you today is a brief qualitative research um, project that was photo voice in nature, followed up by um, semi-structured interviews. So I have a sample size of 23 students who over two semesters attended a critical trauma theory course that I designed and taught. And, um, and so the phenomena being studied today are students' exposure to um, oppression, right? So ethno-racial and other types of oppression. And how then does that impact and influence their learning? And then at the same time, what's happening? Where are the spaces where they can express themselves safely culturally and, um, and to express their myriad points of cultural capital? So what we know, what we know, the evidence is out there that exposure to emotional trauma impacts learning and impacts academic outcomes, right? We know that, but what is not out there and what no one's discussing is the cumulative cultural and collective forms of trauma 
that we in our communities are experiencing? And then how does that create um, additional challenges within education and how we as educators can honor that as well as uplifting our students' cultural capital? So um, where I'm a critical race theorist, that's, that's always going to be my paradigm and my perspective. Um, <clears throat> for this particular study, I embedded relational cultural theory, which actually comes from um, radical feminism, as well as the literature out there about marginality and mattering. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So when our students show up, right, <clears throat> they bring the, with them a legacy of educational challenges, a legacy of educational oppression, right? And what we want to understand is what are we doing to either promote that or to mitigate that, um, to create that safe space. And so <clears throat> what we know influences a sense of marginality for our students is the immediate confrontation of cultural deficit frames in education and believing that <clears throat> somehow students are disadvantaged, right? While also not giving the space for them to share their funds of knowledge or to honor their funds of knowledge. Simultaneously, distrust in educational authorities because of this legacy of academic oppression. Difficulty in seeking help, again, I believe that that is a trust issue. Avoid risk of being shamed, criticized, or humiliated by circumventing educational authority figures. And you know, that means us, right? So not only are we privileged in our education, not only are we privileged as, um, as active social workers who have been able to access education, we are also educational authorities and we need to own and, and understand that privilege and how students experience that, right? Um, particularly if there isn't an, an, an um, ethno-racial affinity between yourself and your professor. So <clears throat> first-generation college attendees, I am, I am blessed to say that I am on both sides of my family. Um, we're laborers, uh, workers out in the field, and I myself and, and many of my female relatives were maids, actual women maids. So I'm the first person on both sides of my family to come up and, um, and to pursue education. And so I, I dream and hope that people behind me have that opportunity as well. All of my loved ones, my relatives in my community as well. So first generation college attendees um, really have a struggle and I can really relate to this with accessing their families as a source of knowledge about this institution, right? And so how to navigate successfully this institution lack of diverse faculty, um, lack of cultural congruence when you stand, you know, when you walk in the door to your campus, right? What are you seeing? How are you um, being reflected? And then also uh, feeling, uh, it, and I also agree with this too, the sense of being kind of ripped out of your community, right? To go seek an education and feelings of isolation, marginalization, and alienation. And, and really relying on those people you trust, like your trusted peers. So those are the things that are influencing um, some of the, the um, constructs of marginality and othering that happen in college campuses nationwide. So, um, so a dear friend of mine and I were actually having a conversation just last night about the fact that anti-Blackness um, is at the nexus of international oppression, right? Anti-Blackness is at the nexus, right? And I also see ethno-racial and oppression-based trauma, so ethno-racial and intersecting points of um, exposure to oppression manifest traumatic symptoms and manifest, um, you know, so I'm seeing this as like, if we really invested in eliminating, eliminating the um, exposure to ethno-racial and other oppression-based trauma, then that would add space for folks to learn and it would also add space to heal, right? So, you know, we're, we're looking at these points of nexus that we can really, um, you know, go after together in, in communities. So, I, so when I first started this work a long while ago, you know, probably four or five years ago, there wasn't really too much out there uh, um, discussing racial trauma 
They're wet in pieces in different places and definitely not in social work literature, right? Um, there, it was crickets out in social work literature about what was happening in terms of racial and ethno-racial trauma, right? We're just understanding that, you know, in the literature, right? That's what we know. But the literature is just finally catching up with racism creates trauma, traumatic symptomology, sexism, homophobia, microaggressions. You know, these are all newly emerging as evidence to create emotional trauma. But when I went looking for a good definition, I couldn't find it. And so I'm sharing with you this definition. And it's it's definitely, you know, part of me coming to you all today is to open this up for critical discourse and dialogue and for us to learn from one another. So if something doesn't feel right, you know, don't take it on. If something, you know, if something does resonate for you, please use it or give me feedback in ways I can improve. So um, I came up with this definition around oppression-based trauma, which is around um, the intersectional identities we all possess. It's the exposure to and lived experiences of personally me mediated one-on-one, -on -one, right, race, the acts of racism, institutional and structural forms of oppression through symbolic, emotional, verbal, physical, sexual, economic, and environmental manifestations across our lifespan. Okay, so... So I really wanted to give us a working definition to go at this. And, um, and, and because I have been, um, you know, it's, it's actually such an honor and it gives me language that I've never had. I'm, you know, my 50th year of life. So it's powerful when you get new words to describe your lived experiences. So when I learned about critical race theory, I just like soaked all of it up, right? I soaked all of it up again, not so much in the, in the social work literature, Constance Huggins, um, you know, many others have, have begun to break down those barriers, but we need to do better with that. So, um, so because I understand a bit about critical race theory, I wanted to create um, key principles of critical trauma theory. And so, you know, again, critical trauma theory is really an anti-oppressive, socially just, and by that I mean emancipatory social justice. A lot of folks, um, a lot of times we don't get the opportunity to name our type of social justice, so I'm talking about emancipatory social justice. It's a micro theory within critical race theory that analyzes educational contexts and organizational and institutional policies through the practice of cultural humility, critical race, intersectionality, um, black feminism, and other um, important theoretical frameworks. Um, we really want to, you know, understand how does this influence systems and how can we do better. So. Uh, we look at oppression-centered structural and institutional barriers to academic success exist in the United States. Um, they are ever-present and correlated with behavioral health challenges. Uh, Oppression-based trauma is cumulative and collective, meaning we, our families, our communities experience it with us, um, requiring our own critical micro-theoretical perspective that delineates it from individual trauma, okay? Um, because that is, that's not, you know, that's very uh, sort of, I, I would say, Western in thinking, right? Um, centrality of the experiential knowledge, evidences. So by that, I mean um, storytelling and our, our, our filial capital, the, the funds of knowledge we learn from our families, express the presence of post-traumatic growth, healing, resilience, and resistance in the face of oppression. So all of that leads to the work that I'm doing. So I give you here... Um, some definitions of cumulative, collective, cultural forms of trauma, because they're rarely discussed and nor are they rarely honored, um, racial or ethno-racial trauma as well. And I want to be really careful about this last um, term. So historical trauma is, is coined by um, an amazing scholar, Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart. And um, over time, she has also introduced us intergenerational healing. Um, and so when I mention this, I also cannot and will not deny the healing that continues to occur um, and the resilience and particularly right now, our need for that, that wellspring of resistance to really stand strong. So my students taught me so much about this. Okay. So, you know, I had 23 students, they, they um, stuck with me, they stuck by me, they helped me to, to create this theory. Um, and so I also want to thank and honor them as well. 
And, and they were, um, it was powerful to listen to them about the levels of racism they and their, their loved ones experience, the level of intersecting homophobia as well, uh, you know, and as well as um, racist sexism. So having these dialogue and getting really deep um, created that safe space for them to gain those words and really, um, and really feel safe in expressing themselves and their lived experiences. So, so I also, you know, really wanted to understand how we as educators might perpetuate oppression-based trauma in educational contexts. I wanted to see, you know, what is it that we're doing or what is it that our colleagues are doing? Um, and I wanted specifically to uplift first the complex grieving, um, not honoring the complex grieving that we and our students are experiencing, um, loss of loved ones from COVID, loss of loved ones from, from other passings, as well as you know, what it, the, the constant, you know, uh, exposure to the losses nationally on, you know, what Michelle Alexander calls the modern day lynching, right? So this is, this is all part of our lived experiences and our students. And so our students walk in with that complex grief. Um, the, the feeling of needing to um, code switch and um, the feeling that you're being tone policed in the classroom setting. So by that, I mean, you know, professional, uh, professional, you know, ease that we, that we really um, require and mandate of our students where students are not necessarily able to express themselves effectively within their own linguistic style. Um, and, and certainly in their own first languages, right? So um, imposter syndrome and, and that, I think, you know, I've, I've been getting real with that lately <laughs> with um, going through my, I'm dissertating right now. So, you know, it's humbling, right? <laughs> so um, imposter syndrome is very real in, in ways that, that we may um, exacerbate that. Uh, one I really wanted to highlight and, and help to uplift um, and keep us just really um, firmly rooted in understanding is racial battle fatigue. So the literature does tell us that students, when they go out into, um, into you know, their practicum experiences, it's baptism by fire, right? And um, if, if there is a, a placement that is um, furthering oppression of the students themselves or of communities from where we come, uh, that will definitely lead to a sense of, you know, possibly overwhelm, a sense of lack of support, um, as well as being directly impacted by racism themselves. And some folks, you know, I, I can speak, let me just speak from my own lived experience of feeling uniquely positioned to, to take that, you know, go at that battle <laughs> and keep going, you know, keep going at that battle. Um, when, you know, my colleagues, um, and, um, you know, those who I trust could also engage in, you know, the battle of confronting oppression and, um, and subsequent oppression-based trauma, and it wears you down, right? So uh, racial battle fatigue is significant, and that's the everyday exposure as well as what's happening to us professionally in, in our classroom settings. So in microaggressions, I definitely don't want to forget to, um, in, in New Mexico, we are um, in frequent dialogue about macroaggressions and what students see, you know, we have Indigenous First Nations and Pueblo and people who, you know, come to our classrooms and are reminded of um, conquistadors. And so, you know, and, and this is um, a painful experience every day. So um, being mindful and aware of any microaggressions and any um, campus environment macroaggressions is so critical. And I want to say we all have responsibility. That is a battle we want to fight, right? Um, and I think in the classroom settings, gaining those skills to move through um, microaggressions in a way that supports Black, Indigenous, and students of color in, in classroom settings is critical. So, um, so, you know, here are some of the quotes, and I think I'm close to running out of time. Here are some of the quotes. I do want to specifically highlight a, um, you know, some of the tools, right? So, so we have to think about how to create, um, and many of, much of this, and I want to thank and honor our um, colleagues at HBCUs. A lot of this comes from, so I'm at an HSI, a, a Hispanic Serving Institution. Much of what I learned and know 
um, actually came from colleagues who have both been educated and also work in HBCUs, historically black um, colleges and universities. So, you know, here, I this is some of the literature that we're, we're honored to learn from our colleagues in HBCUs. So, you know, just quickly, HSI is they're, they're not um, Hispanic serving, often they're Hispanic collecting, right? They just happen to have landed in a densely populated um, area where, you know, Latina people are. So, um, so again, we can learn from uh, strategies for validation, creating welcoming campus environments, immersive learning that feels like family and promotes racial uplift, empowerment, and cultural nourishment. Okay, and a lot of times that's project-based learning where you as the educator are, are in that work with the students. Um, meaningful engagement in and outside the classroom environment. Expressing authentic care for the students' lived experiences in, in, in and outside the classroom. So we have this, this, um, this is a little touchy, right? Like we have this thing, this, um, this inner interplay between um, what may be perceived as boundaries, and clearly those are important. I'm not negating or, or minimizing that. However, I'm saying somehow the relationship has been taken out of education. Relationships, developing relationships with your students that, that are to promote their academic success is not a boundary violation, right? Um, you know, to care about their lived experiences um, is not a boundary violation. So that helps to give students a sense of I matter and someone cares about me, right? And someone's, you know, pulling for me and really wanting to, to um, celebrate my successes. So um, some of the things that my students have told me about that is, um, you know, one student ex expressed to me um, in this research context, expressed to me, you know, professor, I had a professor who, I don't know how, she just knew, right? She knew when I was struggling and she would just send me a text and just say, hey, how's everybody doing? You know, is there anything that you need? Let me know. And that, that came at key times when this student was contemplating quitting the program, okay? So really key things um, like that and, and, and connecting. Also taking the time, again, this comes with, you know, the rigidity of, um, of you know, what's going on in the classroom sometimes. Um, <clears throat> You know, some professors will lecture through an entire lecture and not give students the opportunity to actually um, ask questions throughout and and also to be humble enough to say, you know what, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. It's a great question. And, and let me get back to you and make sure that you and the students know. So that's how some of the students from my study um, noticed how when they felt matter that they mattered. Um, this is the slide that moved me so much and, and really resonated for me, again, as, you know, a mixed Latina um, coming up as a first generation college attendee. This is Ghana's, right? The, the desire to succeed for the collective good. Um, you know, and I, and I never kind of really put it in these ways of thinking about it, but man, my students just move me so much with this. And so essentially the, the long block quote, and again, this PowerPoint will be available to you after our um, time together is describing one student's lived experience of coming up, being an early, um, early mother, right? trying to figure out and navigate education, learning where she could until she was able to engage in, in formal education. She went through the BSW. She went through the master's program. She just did an excellent job. And this quotation is really uh, moving for me. And really what it, it, it encapsulates all of these components of Ghana's, right? The, the honoring your parents' struggle with the sacrifices and academic achievement, centering filial and family history as sources of strength, not shame. Sources of strength, not shame, right? Respect, admiration, and gratitude for um, those who, who raised you. Desire to repay and pay forward, to make a difference, to be a gateway for others in, in the community to gain their educations as well. And this is this gives me chills. Um, educational attainment is fighting the battles of generations, right? The battles of our of our families for generations and generations. So um, I, so, you know, all of this is framed in Yoso's who, who has capital, who's got capital, um, community cultural wealth, and um, 
model, right? So I want to just knock this out really fast. This is something we can evoke in our classrooms to have people begin to think about their own lived experiences with this cultural capital, as well as for them to start framing the way that they see the, the communities and people we serve, okay? So linguistic capital, the ability to, to really um, pattern uh, problem solving differently because we think of it in multiple languages. Uh, resistant capital is my favorite because in, in my clinical life, I used to work with adolescents primarily who were juvenile justice in, in, um, impacted. So, you know, these young people would have the strength to stand up and speak their truth to power, right? That's resistant capital. Navigational capital is being able to move through systems and institutions that were not designed for or by us or other communities of color. Uh, social capital networks of people on whom you can rely, um, right? That that can be there to give you support. Um, and and filial capital. I kind of mentioned this a little bit, but it's it's not just you know your Theo who can come fix your tire, right? It's not just that. <laughs> it's like more, right? Um, and filial capital is actually how we gain our cultural and spiritual knowledge nurtured among our familia, right? Um, the kin that carry a sense of collective history, memory, and cultural in intuition and knowledge. And, you know, I, I love to pose this question to students, you know, who among your elders can tell you their lived experiences with times like these, right? Because we have elders now who can share with us how they've lived through times like these, right? How not just survived, but thrived through um, civil unrest and, and, um, the need for massive uh, transformation, right? And then aspirational capital is that ability to maintain your hopes and dreams no matter what, even in the face of adversity. So, so this is part of the work of, you know, if I'm saying oppression-based trauma, I'm saying at the same time that cultural capital is, is manifesting and um, cultural funds of knowledge are manifesting. Uh, so, you know, we see here 74% uh, of my students who participated um, showed aspirational capital, 70% showed social capital, um, diverse perspectives, critical analysis skills, 65% of them showed that. Um, resistant capital, again, my favorite. <laughs> That's why the, the um, presentation is, um, is called Resistant Research, right? Uh, resistant capital, over half of my students um, could identify times with resistance that, that they have been successful. So how do we do this? Um, again, running out of time, I practiced this, but then maybe I got a little nervous, I don't know. Um, so I want to show you um, what it looks like when we break cultural humility down at the personal and professional levels. This slide, again, will be accessible for you. So cultural humidity, humility is, again, about that lifelong learning and critical self-reflectivity. So we never, ever stop uh, contemplation and critical analysis. And critical analysis in reflection is so important because when we just reflect, we could be reinforcing those ideas that have not helped um, or have been, in fact, hurtful to others, right? And then recognizing and challenging power imbalances, that's where we are right now. Um, so we cannot, as social workers, not take a stand from an advocacy and activism standpoint. We cannot. Our, our profession is, um, is founded, its roots are in social justice, and we need to reclaim those roots, right? Um, and so, you know, here are some questions that I encourage you all to consider, which are about... Um, what have I learned this week from my interactions with students, um, the students I serve? How did I interpret the behavior of my students, um, those students who I serve? How did I know about my conscious intentions? What, you know, because sometimes our intentions don't align with our impact, right? So what can I do to increase the alignment of my intentions with my impact? So many of you, most of you likely know about um, intent versus impact language. Uh, there is a resource within this PowerPoint to help you to understand that, you know, our communication, it doesn't matter the intent that we have, um, especially across, you know, across different um, lived experiences, right? It matters what, how the impact is from how we choose to communicate. We need to learn about that. We need to, um, to create space for reparations if that's possible and 
and um, space for healing if that's possible, right? So that's intent versus impact language. Another tool that I want to go ahead and um, share with you, and this will probably be my last slide, is the opportunity to create community agreements. And that's where you sit in community with your students and you create that culturally safe space to say, what is it that you need from me as the facilitator of learning and from your colleagues, your peers, um, to ensure that you feel safe in um, engaging, being creative, being curious, and engaging in learning? Uh, one way that I create this in, in um, my work is to do caucusing. And caucusing is, um, is just an opportunity where I show up a half an hour early and whomever chooses to show up, um, there is an opportunity to talk about the, their lived experiences and what's happening nationally and globally so that you know, we have a space for healing and then we go into a space of learning. So um, I'm just very honored to be with you all today and to share this work with you. Again, my name is Anna Nelson. I'm extremely, um, just I just feel so grateful. And I wanna say, uh, if you need anything, be sure to reach out to me. Um, and, and so, you know, um, I'll make sure that my contact information is available to you. And I currently um, practice as well as teach at New Mexico State University. So with that, I will close out. Anna Foy, um, a very stimulating and thoughtful presentation. Um, and then also I would say, um, you know, so I'm right up the road from you in Santa Fe. So uh, yeah, I have <laughs> the opportunity to connect with you. Well, let's, let's hope that I, I, I hope that we will someday. So your presentation uh, brought up a lot of sort of uh, questions for me. And, um, and we're going to have some time at the end of the next session for questions from the audience. But I, have a, I, I just have a couple that I love to hear your thoughts about um, briefly. So and I think that your concepts around trauma and the, and the sort of level of trauma that especially BIPOC students bring into the educational environment. So my thoughts though, but it feels as though that in some ways our K through 12 uh, education system in this country is from already that lens is from a majority perspective. So I'd love to, uh, briefly some of your thoughts about what can be done at that level before students actually get to us in social work and at the, at um, in higher education? Oh, thank you for that excellent question. Let me make sure I have everything shut down here so there's no echoing. Um, so you know, I would I would highly recommend connecting with um, folks in Tulane and uh, in New Orleans right now because the phenomenal work that they're doing. Um, the phenomenal work that they're doing right now is so powerful. So they actually have a model where they're beginning to talk about collective trauma and cultural trauma. And they, you know, they are at the forefront of dealing with environmental injustice, as well as um, those incidents and acts of oppression based trauma. Um, what I would say to you is I do have a model that can be applied to university settings. So I did create a tool. Um, past this research that I was able, you may be familiar with San Juan Community College, I was invited to apply a critical trauma theory tool that helped people to analyze their classroom environment, their campus environment, and then their relational experiences with their students. But truly what I would say is the very first thing we need to do is to radically acknowledge that cumulative cultural and collective trauma exists. And instead of perceiving trauma as an individual um, experience, start looking at, as, looking at it as a familial and community lived experience. Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, I'll just make a comment and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, take you off the stage and bring you back at the end of the next session. So I, I started the, um, the session today, the symposium sort of acknowledging a very good friend of mine who just passed, Larry Davis. So Larry and I used to always have this conversation, which I think is related to trauma and how that our systems have um, have tried to address what trauma looks like. Yes. And that's by using the term resiliency. Yes. Right. So the so the instead of acknowledging the level of trauma that BIPOC and those communities are, we sort of um, we move it 
in a different conversation to say that people who show up in our classrooms, right, uh, who come from those from very traumatic environment or in those communities, that they've been resilient. So one of the things that makes them different than other people in those communities that they've been able to rise above uh, all of the trauma and those sort of things. So I'm, I'm only, and I'm not sort of asking this as a question, but I do think as our profession that we need to be very cautious about how we use the term resiliency because we do sort of have a tendency to, to use it as this person rised above everything and then it sort of blames all the other people who didn't rise above as being as sort of blaming the victim in some aspect. Yeah. yeah, and if I could just briefly add to that, 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 you know, when I talk about resilience, I also talk about resilience fatigue, right? And that I agree, it's another, it's another othering, right? To say someone is resilient, because it is assuming that those who are not in those, you know, same spaces are not, right? And, and that's why I try to center this work on cultural capital, because that's something we all possess. And it <coughs> creates in whatever environment, it creates an opportunity to express that. So thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you for the wonderful work. And um, I think one of the things that our profession need is people who are thinking more theoretical as we develop interventions and things that are really, um, you know, that we own and that has been shown to be effective. So the best of luck in the rest of your work in this area and in your, and in your doctoral studies. And we will have you back at the um, end of the next panel to uh, field some questions from our, uh, from our attendees. Thank you very much, Anna. All right, um, so we're off to a wonderful start. Our second uh, panelist for this morning's session um, is, um, by, is gonna be presented by Vanessa Garby, I hope that I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and Tiffany uh, Bathwar. Again, I hope I didn't butcher your name. Okay, perfect. Um, and the title of their presentation, Advancing Culturally Disrupted Pedagogies to Dismantle Anti-Black Racism in the Generalist Social Work Curriculum. So let me, um, let me say a few words about each of our presenters. To, and, um, so Vanessa is uh, MSW LCSW, is a second year in her doctoral studies in a joint social work PhD program at North Carolina a and and the University of North Carolina Greensboro, and received her MSW from the Brown School. Uh, yes, at <laughs> yes I, I'm a former student of mine. <laughs> so, um, at um, in Washington University, uh, St. Louis. Her research areas interests include physical and behavioral health uh, disparities uh, impacting uh, BIPOC communities and aging adults and practice and prevention. Uh, she recently served on the CSW Task Force to Advance Anti-Racism and, and the CSW Substance Use Curriculum Guide National Task Force. Um, Tiffany um, is the, uh, the and I, Tiffany, I'm going to call you by your first name, <laughs> right? um, is the director and MSW program uh, and associate professor at the College of Social Work at the University of Utah. Her research areas interest concludes violence prevention, mental health and health disparities, community-based participatory research and social work education. Um, she is well published and she's offered multiple presentations. Uh, she received her PhD in social work from Howard University um, and her master's in social service, a degree from Bryn Mawr. So we'd like to welcome you both to the stage and look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We are so appreciative to be here. And I appreciate our colleague, Anna Nelson, who just presented, because I really caught that concept of the battle we want to fight, um, because this is definitely a battle we want to fight when we're talking about racism, white supremacy, and systems of oppression. And so we hope to be able to lend um, our take and our perspective on this subject by discussing advancing culturally disruptive pedagogies um, in the, uh, dismantling the anti-Black racism. And I'm very thrilled uh, to be here with my colleague, because uh, many of the tenants that were just spoken about, we have been talking about for quite some time. So to get us started, we want to talk a little bit about um, 
the definition of what culturally disruptive pedagogy is. What do we mean by that? Um, and why do our social work classrooms need it? Um, we want to describe what anti-Black racism is and examine the key concepts and theories informing this work. We also want to take a look at some of what the Council of Social Work Education is doing in response to um, anti-racism and their commitment to advancing this agenda and integrate strategies to dismantle anti-racism at organizational and curriculum levels within schools of social work. And so to kind of quote Ibram Kendi, many of you know whose work has really pushed anti-racism to the forefront of late, um, anti-racism is not a destination, but a journey. And it's one that takes deliberate and consistent work. I think that has been a resounding theme across all of these um, different panels that we've had is that it is consistent. It does take work over time. Uh, it isn't one particular program, agenda, or conference. Um, we also want to look at why we need our professional bodies and organizations to establish uh, language and accountability standards that will assist in pushing an anti-racist agenda forward to respond to the needs of our current practice and learning environments in a way that demands change. And we want to look at how we can do this work um, in ways that provide strategies um, and action steps that can uh, promote this work. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what do we mean by culturally disruptive pedagogy? Um, it's typically um, understood with having three tenets, and those are tensions, disruptions, and self-discoveries. And so with the tensions, obviously something that's discomforting is making whiteness and privilege visible. We're going to be talking about it. We need to say it. Um, and then this idea of disruptions, um, where we're going to be deconstructing standardized truth. We're going to be disrupting, um, you know, the current status quo uh, with new ways of um, seeing different ways of truth and um, lived experiences of Blacks and other persons of color. Um, and self-discoveries, it requires, I think Anna spoke very eloquently about this idea of deepening our awareness, of, of being attuned uh, to what this means. And so within the context of dismantling anti-Black racism, culturally disruptive pedagogy means recentering Black voices and their histories while decentering dominant narratives and knowledge systems. It builds on previous work um, that spoke to culturally appropriate concepts or cultural congruence, cultural responsiveness, and it shifts to a more transgressive and transformative uh, pedagogical stance, which we've heard many speakers talk about, um, that creates and intentionally creates ruptures and ruptures in the systems that present whiteness as the norm for all knowledge building um, so that we can engage and um, access other truths um, in the curriculum and its content based on other voices. It evolves from this idea of multiculturalism. You know, for a long time, our profession talked about multicultural contexts and multicultural programs and multicultural clinical work, but we are moving uh, ahead with this idea that focuses on um, something different. Multiculturalism is typically around diversity and difference within groups, but it often lacks attention to the systems of oppression and systemic racism that continue to marginalize the multi multicultural groups. Um, and so it's often at the root cause of much of the challenges that they face, those systems of oppressions. And in many cases, um, in social human service systems, where social workers operate, um, that often uphold oppressive and racist practices. Culturally disruptive pedagogy is also supported by critical race theory, uh, which embodies this concept of transformative resistance, which we've heard a lot about, um, by recognizing inherent inequalities faced by Blacks and other marginalized groups in their expertise in illustrating understanding of race and racism through their own lives and experiences. Um, intersectionality recognizes multiply marginalized identities and social positions that deepen the chasms of difference due to the privileging of some over others. And Afrocentricity, which was recently presented in a phenomenal CSWE webinar uh, by Dr. Jerome Sheely of Morgan State. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, I encourage you to do so on CSWE's website um, as an integral um, anti-racist framework for the social work profession because of its universalist perspective that extends not only to all marginalized groups, but its recognition of white supremacy as the root cause of what he states as institutionalized, 
internalized and racialized distortions of human potential and self-worth that inherently pathologizes Blacks and other marginalized groups and perpetuates the acceptance that we are fundamentally and characterologically inferior and flawed and therefore must incorporate knowledge sources from, from Black scholars and thinkers that speak to the strengths and normative collectivist and spiritual characteristics unique to the Black experience as a way to uplift communities and inform and shape policy, practice, and programs. Culturally disruptive pedagogy requires the use of storying, co-construction of knowledge, the deconstruction of standardized truths, confronting and acknowledging systems of oppression and racism, confronting and dismantling performative acts of anti-racism, and demanding action-based steps towards real change. It inherently recognizes that challenging the current system will likely cause discomfort while confronting. And culturally disruptive pedagogy requires rocking the boat, getting uncomfortable, the rejection of race neutral and colorblind ideologies, confronting privilege, and rejecting safe spaces that perpetuate dominant norms of comfort and non-confrontation to the detriment of Black voices and bodies. And so with that, we want to take a closer examination of why anti-Black racism, why is it important to social work education? I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's it's really great to be here and a part of this um, Im important forum. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, awesome. Um, so I kind of want to focus a little bit on just beginning about why understanding anti-Black racism is important to social work education. Um, our students are really our next generation. Um, so we really must adequately prepare them to understand and confront system, systemic racism um, if we really want students to be able to um, go out there as professional social workers and engage um, with social systems. Um, social workers, as, as was kind of alluded to in the last presentation, um, have not had prior to the MSW or BSW level um, have not had adequate and um, uniform exposure to um, these historical policies, either in K through 12 education or in the um, sort of generalist or what we think about as general education um, curriculum in their undergraduate education. So there um, are really some specific policies that we deliberately want to discuss in our curriculum when we think specifically about um, anti-Black racism. Um, and those are around sharecropping, Jim Crow policies, New Deal legislation, redlining, um, separate but equal doctrine, um, over-policing, mass incar incarceration, and disenfranchisement. So if we're really not setting that framework um, about why these things occurred and putting them in a historical context, it's really difficult for our students to understand that clear connection um, and that experience of, of Black people in this country today and some of the ongoing police brutality um, that we continue um, to experience. Um, so again, kind of setting that framework, I think, is, is really very, very critical. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we have here a, a really great list of suggestions um, that reflected the themes that emerged um, from the anti-racism task force at CSWE. Um, so I had the pleasure of really being a part of this task force um, very early on and leading one of the work groups around um, faculty development um, and conferences. So. Um, it's really kind of, I want to kind of lay the groundwork a little bit here about um, the task force and then some of the work of the task force and then relate that back um, to the curriculum and in particular the generalist social work curriculum. Um, so back in June after the death of George Floyd, um, again, this time was really a catalyst, I think, um, for our profession to begin thinking about 
um, I, and identifying um, some issues and themes around anti-Black racism and anti-racism in general, and how do we address this um, in the curriculum in terms of preparing uh, social work students to move forward and become engaged and competent practitioners. Um, so some of the background of that work, um, again, back in June, um, Darla Spence Coffee, who's the president and CEO of CSWE, issued a statement um, calling for the CSWE membership, um, members, educators, social workers, and others to help provide um, feedback to the EPOS, resources, and guidance to support our professional ideals. And in this statement, um, she emphasized, quote unquote, that we must take this moment to honestly examine how social work curricula go beyond teaching and appreciation for physical or cultural diversity and empower the next generation of social work practitioners to dismantle institutional racism. Um, so one of the things that came out of the work of this task force, we talked about not just complementing what already exists, but the need to really restructure um, our educational system and the entire way that we're thinking about our curriculum um, in social work education. One of the suggestions that I made um, was we really need to tear the house down and then think about how do we adequately rebuild the house um, reflecting these themes around diversity and inclusion, anti-racism and belonging. Um, so some of the responses to this call, um, there was an open feedback survey asking what changes members would like to see in the 2022 EPOS. Um, and this included over 80 emails from students, program alumni, um, faculty, et, et cetera. So Darla summed up the response as, quote, unquote, they spoke to the need to strengthen social work education by integrating anti-racist and anti-oppressive pedagogies and methodologies. Um, so out of that um, came this list of suggestions, um, essentially, from the task force. There was this task force that was formed, and the task force developed, um, kind of began with thinking about a set of themes around anti-racism, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So one of them, um, I think this was really consistent, was to move beyond, if not altogether remove, this term in the current EPOS around diversity and difference, diversity and difference, and use explicit information and language that focused on discrimination, anti-racism and redistribution of power. Um, so again, this is a fundamental shift in the way that we think about educating our students. Um, so in many curricula, what we see is that diversity, oppression, um, that content is housed within one course, right? So the suggestion I believe is really thinking about how do we infuse this content throughout the entire curriculum? And the suggestion that we are really making and coming up with some very specific um, guidelines around that in this presentation is how do you do that in the generalist curriculum specifically? Um, so again, this shift away from um, difference and diversity around um, you know, discrimination, anti-racism, redistribution of power. Um, and what that really means is moving away from conceptually this idea of multiculturalism, which, which focuses on diversity and difference, but really doesn't look at the um, structural racism and institutional racism that impacts um, BIPOC per persons, particularly, again, this presentation focuses on anti-Black racism, does not really um, take a look at what are the structural reasons um, that we see oppression, particularly for Black people in this country, and going back to some of those fundamental policies that uh, I mentioned before. 
Um, so part of the suggestion, going back to these themes that emerged across the communication from this task force, um, was to produce guidelines on anti-racist pedagogy, curriculum, and practice in partnership with anti-racist activists and scholars. Magnify the voices and theories of knowledge created by and representative of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Make pedagogical change to social work education that can intentionally fill the gaps of U.S. history, um, such as, again, those practices leading to mass incarceration. Um, address and grapple with our history as a profession that has actively participated in racial injustices. I'm going to repeat that for you. Um, address and grapple with our history as a profession and how we as a profession have actively participated in racial injustices. So when I teach social policy, which is a generalist course, I talk about the fact that black people were excluded from participation in um, settlement houses. Um, and that, that um, black people essentially form their own settlement houses because of segregation. So we have to be very aware historically about how um, our profession has participated in, in racism, at segregation, and upholded these policies. So we, we have to be very clear about that in our teaching, because if we are not clear about that, then we continue to make the same mistakes. Um, Prepare students to engage in anti-racist work and partner with and center the strategies of resistance used by Black people in our efforts to address Black social and health disparities. Um, articulate the need for social workers to be self-aware and regulate their own biases and values. So again, this kind of speaks to what we're doing in our practice courses, our generalist practice courses. Um, require ongoing faculty and staff training on the cultures and history of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Prioritize the hiring and support of BIPOC people in social work programs. Add an anti-racist framework to the competency um, and standards. And hold social work programs accountable to be courageous and deliberate in integrating anti-racism into their curriculum. Um, so just to kind of give you a little bit more of a background, um, one of the definitions that we used um, to define um, sort of this multi-level idea of racism um, in the work of this task force was um, racism was defined as an ideology of racial domination in which the presumed biological or cultural superiority of one or more racial groups is used to justify or prescribe the inferior treatment or social position of other racial groups. Through the process of racialization, perceived patterns of physical difference, such as eye um, color, eye shape, skin color, are used to differentiate groups of people, um, thus constituting them as races. Uh, racialization becomes racism, which involves a hierarchical and socially constructed valuation of racial groups, historical, unconscious, institutional, and systemic forms of racism interact with other social forces to perpetuate inequality. So again, thinking about that as a framework of how we teach about um, racism. Um, could you advance the, the next slide for me, uh, Vanessa? So again, kind of one of the fundamental things that I really want to get across here is this is a real shift in thinking um, away from this idea of um, how do we look at or evaluate differences among people and think more specifically about um, systemic racism and those social systems that impact, um, in this case, we're looking very specifically at Black people. Um, 
So thinking about what can we do to address anti-Black racism in the social work generalist curriculum? And you may ask, why are we just concentrating here on the generalist um, social work curriculum? And my reasoning for that is really thinking about the generalist curriculum um, in social work because it cuts across both BSW and MSW um, education and it's an important foundation for the for students, all students to gain values, knowledge, um, skills. So if we think about that foundation of ethical practice, when we think about um, generalist education, we think about practice with individuals, families, groups, communities, organizations. So really understanding and providing um, that basic foundation about anti-racism and infusing that through all generalist courses is really very, very Im important um, because that really, the generalist curriculum cuts across all accredited social work programs, both at the BSW um, and the MSW level. So again, thinking about practice, field instruction, human behavior in the social environment, um, some master's level programs have a course in psychopathology at the generalist level, um, introduction to research methods, social welfare and policy courses. Um, again, thinking about all of these courses through this, um, this anti-racist diversity, equity and inclusion lens. Um, so a couple things I, I wanna emphasize really quickly. Um, in my own course, um, what I've done, again, coming back to this policy class that I teach, um, I've really introduced many of these theories around sharecropping, Jim Crow, New Deal, um, over-policing, mass incarceration. Um, I had my class read um, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. And what I really realized going back to my earlier point is many students didn't have a clear understanding of what Jim Crow even was. So for us to talk about the new Jim Crow and these policies of mass incarceration, I had to first um, produce that foundation. Um, so I use storytelling as a way to talk about this. And um, some of you who know me know that my dad is a social worker, has been in this profession for over 50 years. So I actually had him come to class and um, talk about his experiences as being a social worker in the field for over 50 years, but also talk about his experience growing up in the rural South um, and living through Jim Crow and our, my grandfather being um, an integral part of the local civil rights movement um, there. Um, and he almost lost his life. Our family home was bombed. Um, my dad came to class and told this incredible story. And uh, half the students were in tears because they had no idea. They literally had no idea that um, these things had, had occurred in our country or that people had experienced them in this way. Um, so very, very, I think, moving part. And again, producing that lived experience is, is very, very important. Um, also, the use of experiential learning, um, community engaged assignments, really, really critical. We have a, a course that we teach here at the University of Utah in our MSW program. Um, and it's, it's called Reflexive Practice, Diversity, um, and uh, 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 social, social Justice. And in this particular course, um, students actually have to do an organizational analysis around um, anti-racism in their field practicum. And it's a really, really powerful um, assignment. That could be a presentation on its own, just talking about that, but, but just kind of, I can, I'm certainly willing to talk more in detail um, at the question and answer about um, some of these assignments and, and strategies that we've used. So I'll, I'll take it back over, send it back over to my amazing colleague. Why, thank you. 
um, Tiffany as well, you're wonderful. Um, so how do we facilitate faculty training regarding culturally disruptive pedagogy? Because um, we know as we were doing the task force, there was lots of concern and lots of earnest questions from faculty on how do we do this? How do I approach this without looking um, performative or like I'm insincere? And so we start where the client is. And in this regard, the client must be seen as inclusive of the whole social work ecosystem. It's important that all of us are on board and no one group is seen as exclusively responsible for doing this work and providing this labor. We see inherently a lot of times in faculty um, that the assignments for diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism typically fall on BIPOC faculty, but this is an inclusive uh, experience where everyone needs to be on board and participatory um, to advance this agenda. We recognize allyship as an important aspect of anti-racist work, and we also know that not all allyship is created equal. And so we want to find champions. Um, and to highlight again the work of Dr. Sheely, it's inherent to have a champion because we shift from talking and supporting to active engagement in advocacy, policy, and support for an engagement with direct activism around anti-racism. Being a champion requires being seen, heard, and actively responsive to the anti-racist movement and transformation efforts that will no doubt be an uphill climb inside and outside our profession. And each institution has strengths and areas for growth. It's important to take a look at those in order to gather the tools and resources uh, to address roadblocks that may come up along this journey. Um, when using acknowledgement statements, for example, of any kind, it's helpful to follow it up. As we saw with previous um, colleagues during this um, uh, symposium, um, to follow it up with simple actionable strategies that shift uh, these attempts at being seen as potentially performative to one of sincere interest in doing something about it. That's within the scope, budget, and abilities of the group who's doing the acknowledging. I also want to add a point to talk about gatekeeping. Um, when we hear people talk about pipeline or talent problems, I'm reminded of Dr. Jerome Shealy's discussion of distortions um, when he eloquently articulated the Afrocentric paradigm. And this idea speaks to a distortion of the real problem, uh, which is gatekeeping problem that is intentionally and systematically created to keep out black talent from entering the pipeline. So we need to be ever vigilant of issues with gatekeeping and gatekeepers in our ranks. And in fact, uh, my colleague talked about this idea of um, redistributing power, um, that in fact, we are shifting from necessarily just sharing it to a redistribution of it. And as one colleague had stated in a previous panel, um, that some people who've been holding on to power may actually need to cede that power. So it may be time for others to step down and for new leadership and new perspectives to be heard. And so finally, some specific strategies where resources are differentiated. Um, not all, um, this is not an exhaustive list at, in, in any capacity, but an attempt at getting the conversation started um, and what this may look like for institutions with different access and resources. And we recognize that not all institutions are created equal and will therefore have different ways of responding to anti-racism efforts in their classrooms and on their campuses. So this is a way of acknowledging that all of us can start somewhere, um, regardless of whether you have a low budget or a really high budget where you can bring in you know, scholars from across the world. Um, but we can start somewhere in building learning communities and institutional practices that reflect a commitment to anti-racism, again, regardless of budget um, and at any place in the, in the curriculum. And so now I will turn it over um, for any last comments about uh, additional resources and attach my colleague who wants to talk about uh, call papers that speaks to this work as well. I'm not sure my colleague's microphone is working. Perhaps we can. Can you hear me now? We can. Yes, I apologize for that. Um, I was just saying that um, I've been working with the amazing team at Reflections 
uh, Narratives uh, of Professional Helping, which is a professional journal. Um, I'm going to try to put the call into the chat, but essentially um, Reflections has put together this call for submissions on racial injustice and systemic racism. Um, one of the, the calls is due on May 15th, and I'm leading that in conjunction with my colleague, uh, Shonda Lawrence, who's at Clark Atlanta University. And that's called a call for social work educators to confront and dismantle systemic racism within social work programs. So we would love to, to get submissions if um, folks are interested. And we look forward to just um, getting those fabulous submissions and um, putting that information out there for our profession um, to, to begin to just continue this amazing and important conversation. And so obviously if, if there are questions for us, we certainly want to entertain those. Oh, thank you very much colleagues for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, before we bring our other honor back, and I do have one question and and um, which I think, well, actually there's two areas in social work education, which I think are variables that makes it very difficult to implement these types of changes. One is that most schools of social work hires a lot of adjunct faculty to teach mm -hmm. in, in their program. And then the second one is that even though we consider field education to be the signature pedagogy, it becomes very difficult for schools of, of social work to truly sort of get their agencies that they work with to be as transformative as you think the schools should be in their curriculum. Love to hear some quick thoughts about sort of how you think we should work in that particular area. I, I bring that up because I think sometime when we want our students to be anti-racist or we want our students to do this, we also want them to carry that burden into their agencies to try and transform an agency where they have really no power within that organization to make those changes. Mm -hmm. Love to hear your thoughts. Sure, I have a few thoughts about that. And I actually think um, both of these questions have a common theme around um, training and development. And that's not to say that this is an easy task at all. But one of the things that I've tried to institute in the MSW program at the University of Utah is we have a structure where we have curricular chairs. Um, so in terms of curricular chairs, um, having oversight, let's say that they're, can everybody hear me? Yes, um, we can hear you. So if, if you have a curricular chair that is in charge of all the, you know, policy courses um, and really having that person meet with everyone who's teaching regularly. So that's what we've been trying to do um, is really have those curricular chairs check in and meet with folks as a group regularly. Another thing that we're working on, and, and we're just at the beginning of this conversation, is actually developing a manual for those generalist courses and programs like ours, um, like yours, Dean, where um, you have a huge program and you have four, 400 students and there may be um, seven to 10 sections of one course, it really becomes a, a issue of how do you really train people to implement like anti-racism, diversity and inclusion. So I think first having an infrastructure where you train faculty and you have supervision of adjunct faculty, and then you can overlay that with some of that training around um, anti-racism, diversity and inclusion. So if you have a manual um, or that has some specific training um, pieces and some information, some links, some resources, and then you're checking in regularly with folks about how they're implementing this and how it's going um, before class, sort of during the semester, and then after the semester, thinking and reflecting about how do you build and improve. Um, and in terms of field education, that's a real struggle. That's a difficulty. Because um, one of the things I think we all suffer from right now is that, you know, 
it's hard to find field placements, correct? <laughs> so if you talk about um, trying to um, eliminate placements, you know, based on some of this, these issues around anti-racism, diversity, inclusion, it becomes difficult. I think the first step is to, again, develop some um, specific training. Um, and one of the things that I actually like literally just spoke to our associate dean about yesterday was um, around this idea of um, intersectionality in field education and how we really train um, field instructors to understand what these concepts are, what anti-racism is. So um, I think CEUs is another great idea because um, you have to, you get more bees with honey. That's what my grandmother used to say. <laughs> and um, if you're developing these CEUs where folks are able to come and they're able to get CEUs and, and you're training them on these issues, then it's a win-win. It's a win for the university and it's a win, um, it's a win for, for the individuals as well. All right. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, Vanessa, but we're, let's, we're going to pull uh, oh, no, Anna back. We're going to pull Anna back into the and onto the stage, or bring Anna back onto the stage, and then um, I'm hoping um, that we'll be able to field uh, a few questions from our audience. Um, and so let's go to the first one. And I'm going to think that this is for Anna. How can we institutionalize authentic caring for students to make it standard practice rather than exceptional practice? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question, and, and I hope everyone can hear me while I'm speaking just a little bit louder. Uh, so it, the institutionalization, so it's kind of interesting because authentic caring is, um, it differs across the, the practitioner or the person, right? So to institutionalize that, I think will be a challenge, but I think, um, you know, commanding that as a, a quality of practice it, is something we can do through, you know, um, my, my colleagues here mentioned the importance of um, having supervision for adjuncts. I think we can have an institutional practice of um, creating cycles of critical self-reflectivity, of having those who are more expert in, especially in the work around um, anti-oppression, anti-racism, have those folks be in the room during, you know, circles or platicas the opportunity to really dialogue deeply about this. In, in order to, you know, authentically demonstrate caring, you have to be willing to open yourself up, right? And, um, and I think there's some, you know, tension, um, you know, among certain colleagues where opening yourself up is a sign of weakness. It's not, that's, that's the penultimate strength, right? Um, so I would say, you know, being willing to, to open yourself up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so the next question, I think it's for um, for our second set of pan for our second panelists. Um, how do you see education on anti-black racism reaching professionals already in the field? There you go. <laughs> Um, so I'll take a stab at this. Um, I, I definitely have one foot in practice and one foot in academia. Um, so this really resonates with me. I think part of it and what we're trying to get across is, is the idea of anti-Black racism should be normalized um, as just part of what we do in our learning and training and development as individuals. So definitely infusing more um, content in, in mandatory CEUs around um, anti-Black racism. Somebody in a previous um, panel had mentioned um, the issue of licensure, um, you know, infusing kinds of questions around that um, for our licensure. Um, things that we can do, um, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, recertifying, um, things that we do to continue um, to enlist other um, Black voices and BIPOC voices in the trainings that we receive, um, I think it's going to be integral so that we are not 
out here in practice in silos. Um, and I think that's where CSWE and other um, licensing um, you know, uh, boards have more teeth to have a higher level of accountability. Because um, you, you're right, not everyone is going to sign up for this. So there needs to be something just like we have, you know, Title IX and training on sexual harassment and, um, you know, biases and these kinds of things. We need to build it into our field um, as a routine part of practice and professional and reflective building. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Tiffany, would you have anything to add to that or? or? Um, no, I mean... My colleague is so dynamic. I've I've been working with her for a number of years, and um, she she's awesome. But I think um, what I was was actually thinking just to build upon that is in a lot of states um, you have specific mandates around content. Like I know I'm from Maryland originally, and like you have to have um, a certain number of ethics CEUs. So it would be great if states themselves would really start to develop some standards about requiring um, anti-racism um, you know, content um, as part of the licensing uh, requirements for recertification. Yeah. Excellent suggestion, yes. Uh, all right, so the next question um, is, how would the embracement of education on anti-Blackness into the generalist social work curriculum impact the field education process. We have a lot of people out there thinking similar to me. <laughs> so, so again, to uh, to uh, Vanessa and Tiffany, I know that you already mentioned something about field education. Um, any other thoughts that you think that instead, I mean, how, and I agree with you, and I would imagine that if we talk to many of my colleagues who are deans and directors, uh, or if we talk to the field education directors at most schools, they would say they're highly under-resourced <laughs> to do this work. Uh, and I'm not throwing my colleagues under the bus. I think the field education directors would say that. Love to hear uh, some your thoughts. So I'll just um, touch on one thing that I noticed about field education, because I also used to be a field supervisor when I was an agency. And I, you know, am very motivated. I'm very invested in this work, but not everyone is. And not all departments require uh, or have a mandatory field uh, training where field supervisors are brought in um, on a required basis. And so changing that, flipping the script such that there's, again, a level of accountability that says this is something that we expect you to do um, so that you at least are apprised of what our expectations are. And then even if they build it into modules, um, we're now in the information superhighway. We can have Zoom meetings. There's regular opportunities for low resource um, connectivity and engagement engagement and interaction around these so that we don't have people out there um, where we're not sure what they're doing, what they're teaching, because a lot of times the students are just going to bring it back into the classroom. Um, and then they either are, are dealing with miseducation, microaggressive environments, um, or just dismissiveness because people don't want to say the R word, the yeah. race and racism word. Yeah, yeah. All right. The uh, next question we have is how should we deal with times in which we realize that we negatively impacted our students, particularly our students of color. How do we create a space for healing when we are the source of the harm? So um, Anna, I'll let you go first, but I think we all, I mean, I think that both sets of panelists can respond to this question. I think that that's a, a wonderful, powerful question. I think um, the important thing, as I mentioned before, being open means being open to express when you when you've committed a harm, right? Um, you know, being open to feedback, honest, open feedback to your own practices is a vital first step in transforming those practices. I think also too. Um, the important piece around developing anti-racist and anti-oppressive communication strategies like intent versus impact, like the Raven um, model for confronting microaggressions, fostering and developing and practicing those skills like you would any other skill set, um, I think is incredibly important. And being 
being okay with being uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's, you know, a primary step saying I've committed a wrong. I, you know, with intent versus impact, you know, I've noticed that something I said- Anna, you need to speak up just a little bit more. So it sounds like people- Okay, so I'm gonna look at this way because my microphone is this way, but intent versus impact is really about the opportunity to, um, to notice that you've made a mistake and and to say, um, you know, I apologize because my intent did not match with the impact it's clearly having on you. Don't argue the rationale. Don't say, you know, <laughs> don't say it's because whatever. Literally say, I acknowledge, honor, and um, and and respect your feelings. Period. Right. And if there's an opportunity for reparation, then then make that happen. If there's not, then respect that individual's. Um, need to step away or step outside from that conversation. Uh, so, you know, intent versus impact is always my go-to for how to move through uh, critical conversations. Um, and I know that you don't consider this your area of expertise, but Tiffany or Vanessa, any thoughts? Um, well, I'm actually teaching a course um, this semester um, for doctoral students um, on teaching and learning and social work education. And one of the things that we've talked a lot about this semester is um, developing an inclusive syllabus and really starting from there. So developing an inclusive syllabus. And there are lots of really great resources out there. And we actually provided um, a checklist in our presentation today about um, how do you develop this inclusive syllabus and what are some of the things that you think about um, in the development of your course? Um, how do you think about fostering inclusion as you're, before the class even begins? How are you thinking about this? How are you including this in the syllabus? How are you thinking about this in terms of your teaching philosophy your learning objectives, um, et cetera. So those things are really important. And then also setting ground rules um, because you really have to think about these things in advance about how do you protect people from harm? You, you have to think about that in advance of the semester. Um, and I, I think we're all learning and growing in this work. So if students are harmed, I think it's really important to meet with them privately and apologize and say like, hey, um, I'm learning and, and growing in this work and um, I'm really open to your feedback about how I can do better. But to me, the most important thing is thinking through in advance of the semester, um, how you are gonna plan these conversations and setting those ground rules. Yeah. Well, colleagues, this has been a wonderful set of presentations. Um, congratulations on your on your wonderful work. Um, and then obviously two of you are doctoral students. Again, and the best of luck in your doctoral Thank education. You. Um, and you're already launching yourselves into some wonderful territories where our profession needs to be. Um, before we actually leave um, and go and finish up this first, first section, um, I also want to acknowledge which we haven't talked about, um, that even though there's the trauma around students that's in our program, especially BIPOC students, we cannot forget that faculty of color are also constantly being traumatized in various different ways as being as part of the organization. We sometimes forget that because we feel we have a PhD and we're faculty and we have those sort of things, but we know there are those dynamics as well that plays out along the way. So I think your work is really helpful in helping us really to think about where we move forward in this area. I look forward to following your careers and your work and want to thank you again for participating um, in this um, in, in the first panel of this uh, of section four. All right, so have a wonderful day and thank you very much for your wonderful work. Um, that is the end of the first uh, for the first panel for part four. We will now take a break and we will see you after the break.
Hi there, welcome back. Uh, my name is Laura Abrams from UCLA Luskin and one of the co-hosts of this, um, this great symposium. So this brings us to uh, panel two of the day um, and it's titled Envisioning a Future for Social Work, Looking Back, Looking Forward. Um, we're gonna pick up where we left off this morning where we heard some really, um, I think, great um, and important reasons for us to rethink how we're, how we're doing social work education. Um, this panel will continue that conversation and, and think through what are some of the theories and the knowledge base that we need to have in order to move this work forward. So we're gonna hear about challenging hegemonies, calling out whiteness, and using some of our existing scholarship to push this work forward and our theory base, as well as co-creating new theories that will inform our practices and our education and our pedagogies going forward. So our first panel group is um, taking a look in the mirror to see the future, equitable, creative, placemaking, and social work. And that will be Dr. Chandra Crudup, Crudup um, Chris Fike, and Claire McLoon. So we're going to bring them to the, to the stage. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> And is Claire joining us or not? Claire is teaching right now. Got it. Okay, she's doing her pedagogy. All right. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Crudup, is that how you pronounce your last name? Crudup. Crudup. Okay. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. So let me introduce you. Um, Dr. Crudup is the Associate Dean of Inclusive Design for Equity and Access for Watts College of Public Service and Community Solutions and a clinical associate professor and former associate director of the School of Social Work at Arizona State University. She's a faculty fellow with the Studio for Creativity, Place, and Equitable Communities, and her research interests broadly include relationships and identity and hair identity. Um, she's dedicated to transforming social work research, pedagogy, and practice through acknowledging practices of oppression and exploitation and finding ways to dismantle systems that perpetuate these practices. And Chris, who is an uh, M L L M S W, is I don't know if that's an, an MS in social work, is an activist scholar who's worked as an assistant professor of social work at Saginaw Valley State University since 2015. He also works as a clinical therapist with McDowell Healing Arts Center in Saginaw, um, in Missouri. Michigan. Michigan, okay, very sorry. <laughs> I don't have my MIs, my MSs, and my, um, my states uh, in order today. Chris's interests include integrating critical pedagogical and abolitionist perspectives into social work education, scholarship, and practice, and learning to apply and integrate critical autoethnographic methods into social work research and alternatives he's exploring to hegemonic higher ed and nonprofit industrial complexes. Chris is a member of the Social Work Department's Racial Justice Committee and founded the, his department's Social Justice Rapid Response. Um, Claire, who's not with us, is also a social worker and lecturer at ASU and um, has contributed to this paper. So I wanna welcome you um, in your presentation on taking a look in the mirror to see the future and equitable creative placemaking. Exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we want to start by saying thank you to Laura and Abrams and Sandra Crew, Alan Detlaff and James Herbert Williams for assembling this space to have these important conversations. 
We have appreciated learning and being challenged and seeing that we are not the only ones having these conversations about needing the profession to reckon with our past and emerge forward with new direction. Too many lives have been lost due to our inability to reckon with our own reflection. We're reminded of this um, this week of how deadly and powerful white supremacy is with another black man being murdered, Dante Wright. How long will we, the black and brown bodies, be hunted? My name is Chandra Crudup. I am a black mixed race woman who benefits from light skinned privilege and identifies with the pronouns she, her, hers. My name is Chris Fike. I'm a cisgender white man. I use he, him pronouns. I live and work on the ancestral and traditional land of the Anishinaabewaki, uh, Mississauga, and Sauk people it, then on land that was ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. I've benefited from colonial patriarchal white supremacist systems, structures, and norms. And Claire McLoon, a lecturer, a lecturer in the School of Social Work at ASU, is the other part of our, our team and is unable to join us presenting as she is teaching. Claire is a white woman who has benefited from white supremacy and economic privilege, identifying with she, her, hers pronouns. The photos in this presentation have been taken by Claire in what is now called Phoenix, Arizona, and Chris in what is now called Saginaw, Michigan. Um, we're using Christopher M Emden's reality pedagogy strategy of breaking down the divide between the classroom and life by using images from our community to center culture and place as a means of interrogating our past and inspiring us to connect deeply within ourselves and community to imagine a different future. Uh, today in our presentation, we acknowledge that white supremacy is a mechanism of social control, that our current social structure is grounded in liberal patriarchal capitalism, and that professional social work tends to conform to prevailing social norms. We further acknowledge that social work is complicit in perpetuating uh, white supremacist master narrative. One mechanism for disrupting that master narrative in social work scholarship practice in education, what we call the three pillars of social work, is to create a counter narrative. To create that counter narrative, we'll present a model that intentionally reframes, retools, and refocuses the three pillars of social work. We'll outline the mechanisms for reframing the nature of the person and environment perspective situated within the ecological systems framework, uh, retooling the linear systematic structures we work within and reinforce through scholarship and practitioner preparation, and repairing the harm that we have done to historically marginalized and oppressed populations through centering whiteness. We'll draw from the concepts of equi equitable creative placemaking uh, to envisage a way forward for social work that intentionally commits to addressing historical trauma through reparations by centering equitable community practice to allow generations of people to benefit from a collective and holistic environment. This and the next slide were scripted by our co-presenter, Claire. We separate the profession into three pillars and provide specific examples because the current systems demand a linear format that establishes order and specificity to something that operates like the air we breathe everywhere, all the time, moving and within us, whether we notice it or not. In providing examples of how each pillar supports racism, we also provide new narratives which aim to dismantle it. This is not intended to create a guidebook, but to share inspiration and validation to anyone who is fully ready to get rid of the cancerous racism in our work community. Examples of white supremacy within each pillar are obvious when we discuss disparities, like child welfare, research gaps, whitewashed curriculum. And it's apparent that the entire systems need to change. But as we demand these systems change, we also must change our selves and create alternatives to the status quo. Originally, we had an image here that of a crumbling, disconnected, archaic pillars, because that's how things are right now. But we changed it to this image of a historic church in downtown Phoenix, because this brings to mind social work's connection to policing, history, religion, etc. Understanding and acknowledging the existing scaffolding of white supremacy or the master narrative is part of the work we all need to do. 
Gowardi and Alameda provide a foundation in their article articulating the scaffolding of white supremacy, the act of naming and liberation. In order for social work to be substantial, there must be hope. Imagining new futures and narratives gives us inspiration and allows us to create liberatory spaces while working through imperfect systems. Creativity and imagination are necessary if we're going somewhere that has never existed in social work. Practice examples include Crudup's, my reconceptualization of the ecological systems perspective to move the individualistic barriers, ensuring we aren't policing by other forms of domination, power, control, and interrogating notions of professionalism that create rigid walls instead of open communication. Scholarship will involve teaching, history, curriculum, there's pedagogy examples, reframing everything. Even in preparing for this presentation and paper, what model did we divert to? Was it a model of domination or a model of liberation? In this way, we have to actively engage with the oppressive thought patterns, especially in academia, the land of unspoken rules, which assumes rules work in favor of justice. What if social workers were free from the parts of our work we don't like? What if we didn't have eligibility requirements? or mandatory reporting or grading to do? What if scholarship was truly collaborative instead of competitive? And what if clients called the shots at our agencies? How would it feel to teach and practice truly for liberation? It is creativity and imagination that is needed, as well as being aware of understanding the healing and community building aspects of arts and culture work that piqued my interest when I learned of creative placemaking and placekeeping, the potential of what social work could be if we shifted how we approach our work. Creative placemaking is generally known as the integration of arts, culture, and design into community development and planning. Creative placemaking was coined in 2010 Funders in government and philanthropy were beginning to pay attention to the integration of arts and culture with community development and planning. It's an emerging field that seeks to bring greater humanity to the practice of comprehensive community development and planning. It, re, um, it recognizes that through infusion of arts and culture-based practices, we can better recognize our full humanity and what it takes to create healthy places where all people can truly and fully thrive. The practice of equitable creative placemaking aligns with aspirations towards more just communities. Creative placekeeping emerged in response, equitable creative placekeeping emerged in response to creative placemaking and the need to acknowledge the ways community development often and historically disrupts and erases strengths within the communities and culture that could bridge gaps. The keeping of history and heritage in historical context is an asset rather than erasure that we see happen in communities. Cultural integration into community development work increases community pride and connection and stewardship. Now this obviously aligns well with what we think of as meso and macro social work practice, but we argue that social work could expand the impact of this work by adding more intention around the way micro practice is framed, not from an individualistic perspective, but the importance of acknowledging the contributions of the individual to the whole and its impact to the ecosystem of the community. Maria Jackson sees creative placemaking and placekeeping work as an opportunity to reimagine how policies and practices can better contribute to the creation of health, opportunity-rich environments where all people can reach their full potential. She sees this work as having the capacity to address significant barriers that prevent true systems interventions. And this happens by reframing, retooling, and repairing. We agree with her. Overlaying the aspirations of the social work profession on top of the foundation of creative placemaking and placekeeping could help propel social work to create that counter narrative to the ways we have been complicit to white supremacy in our profession and into a profession that is able to reframe, retool, and repair those harmful ways white supremacy has invaded systems and allow us to construct a transformed future. So reframing is about revisiting our understanding and articulation of societal changes in ways that get at root causes. How we frame an issue has everything to do with how a response is crafted. As social workers, we say we often use a strengths perspective. 
But are we using the perspective on how we identify strengths or how our clients and communities identify strengths? The process of reframing is about looking at how we are fundamentally framing issues and solutions, and if we're doing so to perpetuate inequity and harm. When we truly critically look at what the root or core of the situation is and why it is that way, we move to retooling. Our response to an issue is changed when we reframe, create a counter narrative to the white centered way it may have been framed historically. Retooling is reimagining the methods by which we seek to address fundamental actions. Creative placemaking keeping does this through engagement of active creative practices that allow the integration of public concerns and policies. This could and should be done in microspaces as well. This is where we have to really push ourselves beyond those institutional boundaries that have shaped our conceptualization of what is even possible. Retooling pushes us to drop what Jackson calls our professional armor and makes us open and available to thinking, feeling, and acting. We chose this image for retooling because it so clearly demonstrates we often have to work within and against the system, a system where we all live and breathe. Now, when people and places have been harmed, repair and healing have to be part of the comprehensive community development and planning. This is done by building community and relationships, something social workers are trained to do, or are we? Though through this lens, there is intention about creating spaces where people and communities can be generative places we can interrogate individual and collective identity and circumstances. How do we nourish and evolve while making and sharing? This work leads to individual and collective agency. It leads to revised community narratives with a sharpened critical lens. This leads us to social cohesion and, recipro re <laughs> and reciprocity. Jackson calls it the preconditions for long-term change. This is what the profession and pillars of social work need to consider as the foundation for what profession could be a profession where we join individuals and communities in reframing, retooling, and repairing to move beyond the space of addressing historical and contemporary harm and to a future where we are no longer needed. Social work is a profession dominated by an intoxication of hubris. While we're informed by such lofty goals as service, social justice, dignity, and the worth of, indi of the individual, integrity, competence, and the importance of human relationships, we often become so infatuated with the idea of helping or saving people who are vulnerable, oppressed, and living in poverty that we fail to acknowledge the ascendancy of white supremacy in our profession. We become socialized by the same hegemony we claim to stand against. We become intoxicated by our own hubris. In his case for reparations, ta Coates argues that reparations, defined as the full acceptance of our collected biography and its consequences, invite us to reject that intoxication of hubris in order to see ourselves as we really are. And while there, there has been scholarship asking the right questions and determining that the profession needs to move towards being anti-racist, there continues to be a struggle to decenter whiteness. The profession itself continues to grapple with how to address the work that must be done to eradicate white supremacist ideologies from within the profession. A social work reparations project beckons us to do the intentional work of learning to see ourselves squarely and invites us to take ownership of and responsibility for our own collective racist narrative and its consequences. It's our responsibility to acknowledge, address, and own the ways in which we have been and continue to, to be complicit in perpetuating white supremacist ideologies and the historical and contemporary harm and trauma we've inflicted. Reparations are more than just a recompense for past injustices. They're a reckoning, more than a handout, more than a payoff, more than a reluctant bribe. A social work reparations project is an opportunity to deconstruct our antiquated philosophies, constructs, and norms, to disrupt our own personal and collective guilt and shame and complicity, to dismantle our hegemonic and oppressive systems of power within our own spaces, and to revisualize our practice, scholarship, and education through the lens of justice. A social work reparations project is an opportunity to restore social work, to create a counter-narrative 
to construct an intentionally anti-racist narrative that challenges us to accept, own, and take responsibility for our collective history, invite us to reject our own intoxication of hubris, and force us to see ourselves as we are. If we are to undertake a reparations project to craft an intentionally anti-racist narrative, then we really need to consider our, our readiness to purposely confront our vulnerabilities, to meaningfully challenge our own hegemonic and racist guilt and shame and complicity, and to face the critique of our brutal honesty with humility and with the intent of making reparations for the historic and generational uh, harm and trauma we've caused. And we have to be invested in and committed to a process that will involve substantial time, intensive personal and collective introspection, concentrated and purposeful personal and collective humility, mountainous collective critical consciousness raising, intentional and collaborative engagement, and imaginative revisualization re of the theories, philosophies, paradigms, practices, and norms that have informed and influenced social work practice scholarship in education. This isn't just a reform project. This is a transformation project. Whenever we broach the subject of reparations, we inevitably get the same barrage of questions. Who will, get, who will be paid? How much will they be paid? Who will pay? As a society and as a profession, uh, the performative argument tends to be framed in practicalities rather than the justice of a reparations project. But we know that the concerns aren't really rooted in the impracticality of reparations, but in something much more existential. As Coates suggests, that deeper existential resistance to reparations is grounded in a worldview that reflects that white dominance is just a fact of the inert past, a delinquent debt that can be made to disappear if only we don't look. A worldview that tells us we can move forward without looking to the past, that we can make amends without acknowledging or owning our complete uh, collective biography. A worldview that neglects the need to name and take responsibility for our complete biography, including our complicity in the white supremacist narrative. How to engage in a reparations project is a conversation we need to be uh, more intentional about having in social work. And perhaps uh, we would find that, that we, we could never fully repay for the personal and collective generational harm and trauma we've inflicted. But we discover some things about ourselves through such dialogue. And maybe that's what scares us. And so we must reimagine social work practice, scholarship and education, accept our collective biography and the consequences. Coates further argues that what's needed is an airing of our secrets, a settling with old ghosts. Reparations is work we must do to see ourselves squarely. It means a revolution of consciousness, a reconciling of our self image with the facts of our history moving beyond a critique of our existing frameworks, creating true paradigm shift. It requires reimagined foundations and theories, ones that acknowledge the reality of systemic racism within our own profession, a squaring of ourselves with the facts of our history. One way I have reimagined uh, this is through revisualizing the ecological systems framework. I realized doing my dissertation work many years ago that focused on in, it, that work focused on interracial marriages, that the bullseye image we used to understand this theory wasn't sufficient and didn't accurately represent the theory or the reality of the multidimensional aspects of systems that my couples were experiencing. The image on the right is what emerged. We have begun to build on this new visual to help us better understand the fundamental challenges to holistically move towards repair. It takes this deep critical work to think through how we can address the historical and contemporary harm by looking at ourselves and the systems we are um, a part of in social work as a social work reparations project, a profession that has an eye on true inclusive social justice in everything we do. Coates says, but I believe that wrestling publicly with these questions matters as much as, if not more than the specific answers that might be produced. An America that asks what it owes its most vulnerable citizens is improved and humane. An America that looks away is ignoring not just the sins of the past, but the sins of the present and the certain sins of the future. More important than any single check cut to any African American, the payment of reparations would represent America's maturation out of the childish myth of its innocence into a wisdom worthy of its founders. 
What if social work was a profession that intentionally built culture while making amends? What if social work was a platform for reparations, one that invites us to address harm rather than creating more? What if all the pillars of social work, practice, scholarship, and pedagogy committed to doing this work and held each other accountable in the process? What if we were a profession that focused on healing while supporting? When looking in the mirror, can we see a future where social work is able to acknowledge and promote healing while creating a just future? Could we be a profession to ensure liberation? As we end, we want to again acknowledge the importance of this space we hope that something that was said will spark an intentional action to reflect on the work you need to do to reframe, retool, and repair. It will take all of us to do this work moving forward to address the past while reimagining the future. Thank you. Wow, that was um, not only um, a beautiful presentation visually, um, but also it's just so powerful. I mean, I, I wrote a bunch of R words here. Um, so <laughs> we have reframe, retool, and repair, but I also wrote down restory, um, um, reparations, reinvigorate, and revolution, right? So Maybe there's six R's or seven <laughs> R's here um, in your model. Um, one thing that that came to mind, um, you know, it feels like there's a coalescence of folks around the country, you know, really thinking along the same lines. And I understand conscience, uh, conscientization and ways that we can lift each other up and, and co-educate. Um, but where do you see, or where will this, the, the platform come from in terms of the fulfilling the seven R's or the three R's, right? Where does it need to, it starts with us, but who can solidify this for the profession is kind of, the power question I've been thinking about? Um, it's a great question. It's something we uh, often run in circles mm -hmm. because we're like chicken or the egg, like where do we mm -hmm. attack this? Um, it has helped us to address, uh, to think in the profession as pillars and how the the issue is so multi-dimensional and I love how Claire writes that this is the air because it's all around us and mm -hmm. within us. And we, um, uh, really think that this has to be taken up within each pillar multidimensionally because it's a multidimensional issue. So I think that even the question of considering that it needs to be us one starting place and a platform kind of makes us think back on there's this linear way of solving things. And I feel like we even need to break from that mm. um, and collectively take up the charge and responsibility what if the starting place was everyone versus mm. an actual platform? That's that's my thoughts, Chris. Yeah, I think one of the things that I think about, and I think we brought this up and kind of how we presented the argument, is like we do this work in our own space, right? So so recognizing those spaces that we we occupy and what that look that work looks like for us in those spaces, because it's going to look different for me than it is for Chandra. And it's and, mm -hmm. and so I think that, like there's a recognition of our own positionality um, and understanding what that work can and should look like in those different spaces. Um, so, I'll tack on real quick mm -hmm. too, if it's all right, that mm -hmm. the accountability on ensuring that that work is being done. I do think that there is a place for that within each of the pillars, right? So there are mm -hmm. um, organizations within each of the pillars that hold our profession accountable. And though that is where that accountability to do this work um, mm -hmm. needs to start happening as well. Yeah, so it's almost like, you know, I notice not, I'm, I'm having trouble thinking out outside of the, the building or the scaffolding in terms of if it's all of us, I don't, I want to make sure that doesn't leave um, anyone off the hook. Right. And so um, 
yeah, just something to think about. And I'm and really because of it because if, if it's all of us, then we're also all on the hook. Exactly, that's great. I love it. Um, I really look forward to um, bringing you all back, bringing you both back at the end of this series, um, at the uh, at this panel for more questions. Um, but this really set an awesome stage um, for this group, and uh, we'll see you in a little bit. Thank you. Um, I'm excited. Okay, our next uh, presentation is um, going to build really nicely on this one, Envisioning an Anti-Racist Profession, Social Work's Quest for Truth, Reconciliation, and Social Justice. So I'm pleased to uh, invite here now Ebony Perez, Dr. Perez, and invite back Anna Nelson, if she's still here. Um, yep. All right. Welcome back from this morning. <laughs> All right. So Dr. Ebony uh, Nicole Perez um, has is a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work, um, where uh, and received her PhD from the University of South Florida. So you got your MSW at Pitt. And yes. You may have known Dean Davis then. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she currently serves as assistant professor of social work and undergraduate department chair at St. Leo University. And she uses qualitative methodologies and critical and other race-based theories in her research agenda, which seeks to understand the nuances and complexities of the role of social work educators in preparing future practitioners for anti-racist praxis. Furthermore, Dr. Perez's research and scholarship aims to advance inclusive and transformative policies and practices within social work education. We heard from Anna Nelson um, earlier, and just to remind us, um, Anna is a critical race scholar, an educator, a practitioner, LCSW, a social work professor and a PhD candidate who focuses on racism and trauma and um, and BIPOC populations. So welcome back and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, thank you everyone. So uh, Anna and I are really appreciative to be here and just having this opportunity to come into community and to come into this space with you. And so today we are going to really look at our role in this quest for truth, reconciliation, and social justice as social work educators. Uh, so as we get started, we're going to start with our land acknowledgement. And we, of course, would like to honor and express our gratitude to the indigenous, tribal, and Pueblian peoples who have stewarded these lands in which we work, learn, teach, and practice social work. We also recognize that many enslaved and indentured peoples who were forced to dedicate their labor to the construction of this country and to the very institutions that we work in. To these people and their descendants, we acknowledge the grave injustices inflicted upon them, and we recognize the indelible mark of their labor in the creation of the space which we gather today. And lastly, we really want to uplift, recognize, and honor our ancestors their traditional ways of knowing, their faith, our faith, and the strength that they have given us to continue to labor, endure, and serve in this space and within the social work profession. So we wanted to really start out and look at why this research, what are some of the things that really called both Anna and I to kind of start to question where we were in social work education and in our scholarship as well. Um, I know just a personal bit as I was going through my dissertation process and seeking these critical theories within social work literature, they were very hard to come upon and were really far and few in between. And what I noticed was that social work education 
curricula, praxis, research and scholarship was very colorblind and also colonized. And I like to thank the previous presenters who, you know, they talked about that intentional action to reframe, retool and repair. And I think that really fits into what we were looking to do with this research is just that, to reframe how we look at education, to retool ourselves as practitioners and as educators, and really to repair and to heal and to be able to move forward, um, which may include dismantling our current structures and as we know them. And so when we look at the Code of Ethics by NASW, as well as CSWE, they both really, they mentioned social justice, but racism was really ignored in this NASW Code of Ethics. And CSWE, they only tangentially address social justice and oppression in the competencies of two and three in the 2015 EPAS. I do know, and many of you out there may have already read up on some of the changes in the 2022 EPAS, which definitely now are proposing to include anti-racism within our competencies. However, we must keep in mind that many programs out there are still going to be affirmed and accredited under the 2015 EPAS because the drop dead date for people to make these changes or to go by the new EPAS is not until August 1st of 2024. So we still have quite a bit of ways to work um, with the 2015 policies. So in 92, McMahonan and Alan Mares, they did that seminal study is social work races. And then that content analysis, very succinctly, the answer was yes. <laughs> and the major analysis of the four social work journals, um, there was definitely bias that they found throughout. Corley and Young in their expedition in 2018, they wanted to find out how far had we come since that 1992 study. And what we found at that point was not very far, that out of their around 1,700 social work articles in an 11 year period, only 123 addressed the lived experiences and social conditions um, of individuals who identified as Asians, Pacific Islander Americans, African Americans, or Black, Latinx, or Hispanic, and Native or Indigenous populations. So when we think about our literature and where we have come from, you know, we can argue that a professional, a profession's journals not only is purpose to disseminate knowledge, but also really highlights the most critical issues and populations of concerns that we want to address as professionals. It also suggests a level of commitment that we have to these individual issues and looks at what is our professional response to these critical issues that we have um, identified. And what we found in the literature is that social work has really been regulated to being diversity managers, that when we think about in the wise words of Dr. Davis, um, he spoke about the ignored grand challenge of racism still being out there. And McCoy talks about how we are currently and have persistently been in this battle against violence and racial terror. This is not new, right? And McCoy also argues that this current crossroads that we're at is really going to push white social workers to reckon with the benefits they have received due to racism. Our responses thus far as a profession have really been insignificant in the light of the rise of the far right. And as faculty, we cannot ignore that people who are coming into our classrooms, as we very well know, come from a wide variety of positionalities. And our faculty who are addressing race and racism in the classroom have been met with all types of issues from student resistance to minimum institutional support, um, and also not having that support from programs such as NASW and CSWE in the way of professional development even. One of the things that I found in a recent study of mine was that undergraduate social work educators were often 
stated that they had to self-educate and to learn how to talk about racism and to really figure out how to bring this knowledge into the classroom and to teach around issues of racism. Dr. King, you know, he stated in one of his letters to civil rights leaders that we do not need more allies who are more devoted to order than to justice. And in this guise for us to reframe, retool and repair to borrow from our previous panel, um, this literature and what we have committed to in our professional journal journals really speak to how we are going to reframe, retool, and repair. And with that, I will pass the mic to my colleague, Anna. Thank you so much, Ebony. And, and this is, um, for me, a, a real passion project as well. So um, so I agree that uh, we rely heavily, uh, particularly those of us who are in isolated settings, on um, on how to self-educate and how to to gain pathways for this true, you know, process of reconciliation. So we posed a question um, in response to the two seminal articles Ebony discussed. We posed this question: Is social work research addressing race and racism after 20 years of invisibility in the literature. And uh, we we diverge slightly from the original two articles in the journals we chose to include in this study. Uh, so we looked at you know four different journals. I'll get into detail here shortly. The sub questions we were curious about is how many of the how many articles addressing race and racism did each of the four selected journals contain from the periods of 2015 to 2020. Of the articles meeting these inclusionary criteria, with what frequency did recommendations for individual change uh, appear? And then how frequently did recommendations for structural change appear? Our perceptions that these four journals, so we selected these journals because of their expressed intent to provide uh, more progressive content. So is our perception that these four journals are more likely to ad address race and racism accurate? So um, the four journals that we selected are Urban Social Work, um, Journal of Social Work Education, Ephelia, and Critical Social Work. Those were the four journals we looked at. Uh, so our methodology, so it, I've, I have been so blessed to, to be a part of Dr. Perez's process in this and, and to share platicas with her, so opportunities to speak more. Um, then, then we really laid into the work. We looked at these four journals over a period of five years, um, and we conducted a content, a robust content analysis of these journals. And we also participated in analytic memoing, um, which is just is an uh, it's a, a way in which we can crystallize findings as well as to assure the trustworthiness of this research. So a little bit about Platica. So Platica, you know, emerges from um, from Chicana feminism. It emerges from Lat Crit. Uh, work and it also is just a natural practice where we learn through uh, relationship and we learn through dialogue. And this is, you know, again from my earlier presentation, this is also a space to heal while we're learning and we're co-developing um, knowledge and uh, new space. So uh, it provides a space to dialogue on the research while offering one another support as critical race scholars. Um, it is a method to design, you know, create this um, trustworthiness within our research. And it's intimate conversations interspersed with inter intellectual dialogue. I think that really resonated for me with my experiences in this process. So, um, so the content analysis is, is simply, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's just a, a critical social science method, methodology to analyze and extrapolate themes from large bodies of text, right? I mentioned um, social work education, urban social work, Athelia and critical social work were the four we selected um, for this content analysis, the four journals. Uh, the, criterion, the criteria that we used were similar to the seminal articles previously, but we adapted it slightly to, to also take into account Black Lives Matter, say her name, and other um, important social movements right now, and to see if these are being mentioned in our literature. 
Uh, so we looked for Black Lives Matter, defund police, say her name. We also looked at uh, myriad uh, ethnic terminology, including Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as well as specific ethnicities and nationality as well. We looked at immigration um, status. We also included two terms um, because we wanted to see how frequently they were used, which is with diverse populations or in multicultural settings. The second criteria was, um, did these articles recommend individual change or institutional or structural change? So those two criteria needed to be met in order to be included in this content analysis. Um, this may be small and difficult to read on your side, so I just want to take some highlights. What you'll notice, and I'll get into the numbers here shortly, what you'll notice is, no, um, our, our assumption that these journals would be more progressive. Um, with the exception of urban social work, we did not find that to be the case. We also did not find, um, we did not find that, that these journals were specifically narrowing their focus to particular aspects of a lived experience of a population. So for example, where we are grateful that um, black individual, black research, right? So research focusing on Black lived experiences were present, particularly in urban folk work. Um, when we learned about Latine or Latinx populations, they were often subsumed into articles with other ethnicities, right? And virtually invisible were the experiences with Indigenous First Nations lived experiences as well as Asian Pacific Islander and, and so many myriad other ethnicities uh, that are worthy of their own research. So that was profound to us. So if we just kind of eyeball it, um, the, the, to the total number of articles that we scanned and conducted this content analysis was 798, so close to 800. And so um, our sample size was only 140 of these almost 800 articles. Um, so again, you will see overall um, most well balanced and reflected was in the urban social work journal. Uh, and where we thought critical social work would, would give us some insight and some opportunity to learn more about critical race and other critical theories. Um, unfortunately, we did not find that to be the case. And Aphelia is known to be a, a feminist oriented journal. Um, we, we unfortunately found that very few articles in this journal attended to the specific lived experiences of uh, black, indigenous and people of color. So, and we had a pretty easy mix between uh, individual and systems recommendations. So we then took it and coded it and, and I wanna turn it back over to my dear colleague we then took our, our findings from this content analysis and coded these articles based on critical race tenants. Um, so we have tenants one through six here. We found what emerged most profoundly was racism and intersecting oppression is ordinary and endemic. And those words were not used, they were indicated. So we really had to do deep dive to find that. We also found that generally there was a, a strong adherence to um, critical race um, theory tenet six, which is around social justice. Rarely was social justice defined and it was not included within this larger critical analysis. Okay, so that, that's the data there. So um, turning it back over to my colleague. And so thank you, Anna, for that. And so really, as Anna shared, what we found, unfortunately, is that our social work curricula practice and research and scholarship continues to remain colorblind and colonized. And these journals, which, you know, we really wanted to take an opportunity to expand on the previous work um, of the two previous uh, research studies that happened and really look at these critical journals addressing not just critical race theory, but also other forms of critical theories that really look for equity, truth, reconciliation, and abolition. Um, and what we found was that these topics were difficult or even impossible to access. Um, I work at a liberal arts teaching institution and we have a robust library and still some of these were very hard to uh, get a hold of. 
again, as Anna shared, that the three most frequently addressed tenets were race and racism as ordinary, challenging the dominant ideology and that social justice bent, which makes perfect sense for areas that are using that critical race theoretical perspective. Um, and we know that we need more scholarship out there that addresses race as a social construct, this idea of entrance convergency, as well as that critique of liberalism. We all as social work educators operate in institutions that were not built for people of color. They may have been built by black and indigenous people, but they were not built for us. And so these systems that we really need to look at, we need to do a better job at critiquing those. And while social justice is liberally referenced and it is rarely defined, and we definitely aren't having conversations about um, distributive versus emancipatory justice. And so while the literature is out there, as Anna shared before, for black, um, and African, or those who refer to themselves as African Americans, we saw very few articles with that Latine or Afro Latine, that Asian Pacific Islander issue, um, and these indigenous populations. And so I think that is very telling because while I am definite in agreement that anti Black racism is a worldwide phenomenon that needs to be addressed, we also need to consider that these other populations have their own unique experiences that deserve to be researched. And the Indigenous First Nation articles that we did find really emerged out of Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. And so the, one of our things is that this lack of critical analysis is really problematic for systemic transformation. Next slide, please, Anna. And so some of our recommendations are, we really need to start to do scholarship around healing-centered and relational cu cultural approaches versus evidence-based practices, because these evidence-based practices often leave out black and brown populations and black and brown ways of knowing. We need to look at emancipatory curricular and pedagogical practices, which we've heard throughout these panels and really prioritize opportunities for uplifting and positively reflecting cultural identity and capital, right? We are a joyful people. We need to insert some of that back into the curriculum and embrace that liberatory pedagogy and center the belonging and mattering as we challenge these strict boundaries of who we are as educators and really center the relationships to build community and promote joy. Um, for institutional transformations, we need to have anti-racism expertise in the teaching requirements within CSWE EPOS. We also need to foster professional development within CSWE and NASW. Again, it's not until 2024 that these things are going to take place. So what are we going to do in the meantime? How are we going to help people fill that gap? And really increasing this scholarship to dismantle racism and anti-Blackness throughout institutional resources and you are through institutional resources and funding and embracing this shift from cultural competence to humility within education and research as we integrate macro practices of race and racism in all of our pedagogical practices, research, and scholarship. And with that, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that presentation. This is just um, such an exciting day, not just the theory, but um, looking at, you know, okay, so we, we say things have changed and we have critical journals, but really what is being published, right? Mm -hmm. um, we are going to bring you back at the end, but I'm just going to ask you one quick question. Um, what do you, you know, there's a critical mass of folks wanting to publish this material. And um, is this a barrier in how it's being advertised keywords or is it the gatekeeping of the journals? Um, the whole pipeline issue, like, I guess, what are your thoughts about some of these obstacles? Mm, I think that's an excellent question um, that is absolutely worthy of further research, first and foremost. Yeah. However, <laughs> anecdotally, I will say as an early career scholar who 
is just trying to get her work out there. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that my chair really taught me to do is like look at the journals that are already out there and see what they are publishing. These journals would have been on the surface journals I would have been really excited to put my you know, work forward to, but after taking this deep dive and really seeing what they are publishing, I don't think that from what I'm seeing, there would be a space for my work that is explicitly anti-racist, that is unapologetically anti-Black racist centered, that really is very critical because that's not what they're publishing. And so, I think that is a question. And when we think about, you know, decolonization, let's look at our practices when we, while we value the type of work that we're doing. We go to these peer reviewed journal articles. This is what we're taught to do, what we're socialized to do. It's what we teach our students to do as opposed to looking at books and book chapters. And so some of this work could be out there in book chapters, but that's not where we funnel people to go through initially. So we did not, Anna and I, we did not include book chapters in that. This work could be out there in that realm, but it's not in the journals. Yes. And I also wanted just to add, Ebony, thank you so much for that reflection. It was a powerful moment in our platica to realize, you know, would we would we publish in these spaces, right? Um, you know, another uh, observation I don't think I highlighted, but it's really important is that um, there is a safe safety, you know, it's like a safety net of using diverse populations or in multicultural contexts. And in one particular prominent journal, um, the majority of those articles were couched in those terminology and not in, again, the lived experiences of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, period. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, you know, it was glossed, you know, a little bit of ethnic glossing going on there. Yeah. To be continued, I do have, I have some specific suggestions, but I'll... I can save those for um, another another moment because we're going to bring you back on later. Um, and thank you so much. We'll be back for the general Q and A. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next panel, we are actually inviting back again uh, from. I think it was part two or three of our symposium, our group from uh, Dominguez Hills, Cal State and Los Angeles, my fellow uh, Los Angelinos, Susan uh, Nakoaka, uh, sorry, Susan, um, <laughs> um, Larry Ortiz and Adriana Aldana, who are our well-noted uh, critical race scholars um and um they are going to be presenting really building so nicely on this panel uh on lat crit and social work epistemology dismantling whiteness in ways of knowing and um i think this will really extend the conversation because what we have been really talking about here is epistemologies right um and this second paper that we just heard was about uh, you know, the epistemologies of scholarship and the first paper laid out the retooling of the epistemologies. And so now we're going to build on that through the lat crit um, and social work. So Susan is a, a doctor, sorry, PhD from UCLA um, and uh, earned her master's in Asian American studies and also her MSW at UCLA and um, a PhD in urban planning. And her research focuses on the intersection of race and community development. Um, and her work includes a case study of a native Hawaiian community, an oral history project of Asian Americans, and the development of critical race pedagogy and social work. And as a Chicana Japanese American, her identity and her family's incarceration experience during World War II inform her teaching and scholarship. Um, Larry Ortiz, Dr. Ortiz is a professor of social work in the Department of Social Work and Social Ecology at Melinda University. Um, and he also has a 
dog who's barking. <laughs> um, he also serves as a director of doctoral programs uh, in social work, and his writings have been very influential in the field of CRT um, and in the postmodern critique of race and social work curriculum and the Lat Crit lens, which we will hear about. And Adriana Aldana, Dr. Aldana earned her PhD from the Joint Doctoral Program in Social Work and Psychology at the University of Michigan. And her scholarship examines participatory action research and intergroup community organizing models that build youth capacity for anti-racism. Her research has identified the processes that promote young people's ability to think critically about their identity privilege and oppression and inclusive social action tactics. So we're excited to welcome you back to part four and uh, looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Abrams and all of the conveners of this four part symposium. We're so honored to be a part of, of two of them. Uh, I am Susan Nakoka. I'm actually assistant professor and undergrad program director at Sacramento State. And thank you everyone for joining us today in our talk on Latcrit and social work epistemology, di dismantling whiteness in ways of knowing. Um, although other scholars guide us and have done some of this work, we're still in the midst of dismantling the myriad ways in which whiteness impacts our knowledge base and thus our praxis. So we hope to present to you our conversation on this topic. Uh, emerging in the mid 1990s, Latcrit was a growth of critical race theory. Um, that movement in the legal field as a movement of outsider jurisprudence that pushed critical theory to consider race beyond black, white, binary. We may not have all the answers, but hope to continue the conversation that includes social work scholars, Keen and Franco, to present Latcrit as a way to move forward. And we look forward to your thoughts after our presentation. We do want to um, acknowledge um, the land and labor. And since this is a national audience, we are expressing our gratitude to indigenous peoples from more than 575 tribes and pueblos, who are the first people and traditional stewards of the land on which we live, teach, and practice social work. We also recognize the ties between higher education and the North Atlantic slave trade. Profits and from slavery helped found and shape college universities, campuses and enslaved Africans built and it served in these institutions. We also hold sacred the labor of immigrants often exploited, indentured and underpaid that built and continue to serve our institutions. We honor the labor and resistance of these ancestors and acknowledge that we benefit from the land and strive land and labor and strive to work towards liberation for all. Um, we want to also start by situating ourselves in this work and using a lat crit, crit scholars quote that the process, uh, Lindsay Huber Perez, the process of arriving at the work we do is just as significant as the products we create. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think Larry's going to go first. I'm going to hand it off to him to um, talk a little bit. Okay. Well, I, did we um, <clears throat> again, thank you so much for the honor of speaking uh, today and for this uh, and for giving us a voice. Um, this is this is a long time in coming uh, because we don't always are these voices have not been heard as we have has been has has been well established previously. Um, so let me just say that as a heterosexual Latino male of mixed descent, with over thirty years of teaching and administrative experience in social work higher education, who has enjoyed privilege as well as being summarily dismissed in academia. I approach this topic of dismantling whiteness in social work education with a sense of honor. And I'd also like to paraphrase Paulo Vieira in, uh, who says in the introduction of his pedagogy of hope, something like this. I share these thoughts with you today. Please understand they come from a position of frustration, sadness, anger, and love, because without which there is no hope. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so much. I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Hello, I'm Adriana Aldana. I'm a cisgender Chicana born in the U.S. to Mexican immigrants in the Tongva territory, currently known as Los Angeles. Our relationship to Latcrit began as a college student when I was first introduced to Chicana feminist epistemology. But my sense of self and relationship to racism in the U.S. began much earlier than that. Growing up, I always felt like I was walking a tightrope 
between the hyphen and my Mexican American experience. Latcrit really gave me the language and historical context to think through my experience. I know now that I carry the history of colonization and chateau slavery in Latin America in my DNA. I feel a self sense of responsibility to not only reclaim my indigenous roots, but acknowledge the light skin privilege that I inherited from my European ancestors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and for me, I identify as Chicana and, and Japanese American. And because I did not know my biological father who was Mexican American and Irish and raised by my Japanese American mother and Japanese American adopted father, my identity has been a central theme in my life and work. Um, my parents were both born in World War II concentration camps. Therefore, racial injustice has been a theme I can't escape in, in my work and in my life. Uh, I've been grounded in a Chicano, Chicana identity by having been born in East LA and raised in a suburb of East LA, having a partner who's Chicano and Yaki and a son who identifies as Chicano Japanese yet reclaims identity, um, the indigeneity um, of Chicano identity through Lakota spiritual practices. My academic roots are such that I've been honored to learn from our social work leaders, such as Deb Ortega, Betty Gar Garcia, and of course my colleague, Larry Ortiz, but also Juan uh, Gomez Quinones in Chicano studies from UCLA in my undergrad days. My dear doctoral advisor, Leo Estrada in urban planning at UCLA who got many mothers of color through to the, our doctoral finish line. And most pertinent to this talk, I had the pleasure of spending my doctoral years at UCLA witnessing the beauty of Daniel Solorzano's research apprenticeship course, um, which was kind of based in education, um, but where he fostered Latin scholars um, across disciplines other than education. Uh, as Adriana said, given our positionality, we don't intend to speak to every Latinx experience and epistemology, especially since our, so since our social location is very much focused on our experiences as lighter skin, California-based, non-Black Latinx perspective. So um, what, what are we talking about? Is social work epistemology at its core structurally racist and oppressive uh, is kind of our overarching question. Uh, by epistemology, we're referring to knowledge, knowledge creation and ways of knowing. Epistemology asks, how do we know what we think we know? And in applying this to social work, it leads us to think about what do our theories say and how do we build knowledge through research that can be applied to practice? CRT and LATCRIT often define their work as outsider jurisprudence and themselves as outsider scholars due to their status of being outsiders within the academy. The three of us as outsider social work scholars have had to consistently fight le for legitimacy and validation in our work and we rested on the questions on this slide which form the basis for our talk. Uh, what knowledge is valued? whose cultural assumptions inform methods of knowledge production, and can LATCRIT serve as a tool to transform social work? So I won't go through the sub questions, but the PowerPoint will be um, available uh, later for those who register. Uh, to answer these questions, the premises of our methods of inquiry, practice theories and policies need examination for their bias favoring a white normative narrative. First, we're gonna talk about how social work theory and research has been presented to us as value neutral, devoid of the bias that comes with privilege. Next, we'll provide an understanding of how LACRIT, which emanates from legal scholarship, um, has been widely applied, can help us to root out the theories of ways of knowing that are actually in opposition to social justice. And finally, we'll provide examples of how that crit shows us the way to transform social work. Larry. Okay. If I can get a word in here with Sochi, uh, or with Sochi, maybe. Anyway, what I'd like us to consider is this really important question. How is it that the canon of thought in all social sciences in westernized societies is based on the knowledge produced by men from five countries, Italy, France, England, Germany, and the USA. And these countries share obviously some common cultural and political sem uh, similarities. They, they're capitalistic in nature, they share individualistic values, they're enamored with positivistic science, they identify as Christian, and they've historically engaged in world domination through conquest, genocide, and colonialism. And as Christians and colonialists, they have imposed their worldview on others, believing their behavior somehow so benevolent or the will of God. Hold on, just a second. Good girl. 
Okay, hence the theories that are generated by these means of knowing are considered objective, okay? They're superior. It is the bar by which all else is measured, resulting in systemic credit. The, thus rendering all other forms of knowing to be inferior. I must just tell you a little bit about surgery. She's home with me because she's recovering from some surgery. So <laughs> she's here, otherwise she'd be in daycare. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Let me just say that if this proposition seems reasonable to you, as it does to me, we have to consider the fact that the theories that we teach in social work, the methods of inquiry that we pursue, the practices that we teach students are rooted in this epistemic privilege. And as such, they're inherently rooted in dominant cultural values, which then calls into question, how relevant is our social work education to the rest of the world that is not white, European, male, heterosexual, or colonialist? So using the partial list of some of the questions raised earlier, it seems reasonable that anti-racist, anti-sexist social work educators should engage in critiquing the theories we teach and the procedures we practice in light of their inherent racist, colonialistic, misogynistic, heterosexist, et cetera, biases. So we have to therefore engage in this critiquing process. We're asking the questions, how do our programs reflect both in content, the explicit curriculum, as well as the implicit curriculum, how do they reflect our commitment, the value of our profession to anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion? Next slide. Thank you, Lee. Hello? I feel like I hear a little bit. All right, I'm gonna to try to go ahead. I feel like the echo issue has been resolved. Since the 1990s, postmodernism has influenced American social work. The postmodern critique um, really asks us to think about the idea of a single truth and question the notion that social work knowledge is impartial, value neutral, or objective. Now, some have critiqued the postmodern lens in social work as an assault on rationality and truth and conclude that by shifting towards a postmodern approach to social work knowledge, we have a derivative knowledge base that's generated largely by other disciplines. Now, what we have found is that although we use interdisciplinary theories in social work, we haven't really embraced various methods of inquiry or knowledge production. Instead, as some of the previous panelists have shared, we have these narrow definitions of what constitutes knowledge, but also what constitutes research. And we also have, through our competencies, this dichotomy of research-informed practice and practice-informed research that doesn't leave room for space where research is practice. Next slide, please. Now, on the surface, our approach or orientation to knowledge production may not have obvious links to racism for some, but if we think critically and we borrow from Jones and Okun's framing of characteristics of white supremacy culture, we could see that what we're finding in social work scholarship is this upholding of some of these characteristics. For example, the emphasis on quantity over quality or the worship of the written word really reinforces this publish or perish culture in academia that de-incentivizes collective and participatory methods of research that take more time building relationships. They may not always produce peer reviewed journal articles, but other products that are effective in creating change for the communities that we're working with. It also devalues multiple ways of knowing or methods of inquiry that really privilege this notion of positivism, qualitative study, quantitative studies, and randomized control trials as the gold standard for evidence-based practice. That's specifically connected to the idea of only one right way of doing things. 
We also see paternalism in social work research, this idea that those who are in power have the right to make decisions for the communities that they're researching, right? So this idea of research as power over rather than power with participants. And then also individualism and objectivity is seen through the emphasis of individual objective researchers who are studying individual level outcomes. And again, we're not saying that all social work research is this, but that the dominant way in which we engage in knowledge production within social work does uphold these characteristics of white supremacy culture. And I'm sorry, Susan, I forgot that I was going to hand it off to you. But we're going to be moving on into thinking about, well, how do we decolonize the epistemology and social work? How can LATCRIT serve as a tool to transform our pedagogy, our research, and practice? There we go. Oh, that's right. Um, so, and I think at this point, it's also important to note, note like the appropriateness of it. A lot of our schools have an increasing and, and nationwide and increasing population on student body of Latinx students and particularly um, uh, Latinas. And I think our communities are also facing this um, a wide variety of issues that are relevant for the Latinx community. Um, so why LATCRIT or what is LATCRIT? Uh, we mentioned that it has this um, history in the legal tradition and education. Uh, it was formed over a series of conferences in the mid 1990s led by Latinx scholars who pushed racial discourse beyond the black white binary. Reflecting on the diversity of the Latinx population, their own identity and the needs of the, commu needs of the community, LATCRIT's concerned with anti-essentialism, anti-subordination, a multiple consciousness and looking to the bottom or what who are we talking about what's the population saying you know in social work where, where is the client and what are they saying LATCRIT is praxis and our colleagues in education have evolved the theory and often center the experiential knowledge of scholars and students in in our praxis in addition to other CRT themes in the literature are issues of liminality or in-betweenness of Latinx identity in the U.S., this insider-outsider status, racial construction, which includes the social construction of race and racial formation, um, being in, in the borderlands or issues related to the borderlands, right? So citizenship, immigration, indigeneity, um, both kind of in a, in a practical sense and an identity um, sense. Um, I, Francisco Valdez is one of the early CRT um, LATCRIT scholars in the legal realm. And I, if you think, I'm going to read the quote, but think of social, replace law with social work in terms of how we propose we're going to move forward. Um, outcrits generally sort of strive to uncover and combat the use of law to perpetuate past injustices or to prop up traditional hierarchies based on colonial era conquests, biases, or beliefs that continue to privilege neocolonial in groups. Outsider scholars like the realist and the CLS crits sharply question the neutrality and objectivity of law as an autonomous science of fixed principles and instead believe that law operates typically as an instrument of oppression used by ruling classes against the masses. Um, Adriana is going to continue to kind of talk about how we move this forward in social work, but that quote serves as, as a frame. Thank you. Yeah. So when we think about LATCRIT perspective in social work, again, it is critiquing these dominant methods of inquiry and practice theories and research assumptions as being value neutral. And specifically, it also gives us tools to advance a more nuanced understanding of race and racism through the tenet of differential racialization, which is part of critical race theory. Within a LATCRIT perspective, we're really thinking about the racialization of the concept of citizenship, again, the idea of border or borderlands and language. LATCRIT also advances integration of intersectionality through a critical understanding of colonialism as a structure of white supremacy, Christianity, patriarchy, and capitalism. LATCRIT integrates feminist critique, queer theory, and indigeneity. And as Susan has mentioned before, it also speaks to the experience of immigrant and mixed status families. Uh, finally, I'll say that it aligns with our commitment to social justice within social work and really emphasizes the idea of meso and macro level practice as necessary.
we can see in research, for example, um, that our scholarship really borrows from and is inspired by decolonizing methods and thinking about research as ceremony, as research as something that's sacred, that's done in relationship with the communities that we're interested in advancing racial justice with. We center narrative inquiry through testimonials or storytelling and oral histories. And we really value this idea of what Valdez calls rebellious knowledge production, right? The idea that we're countering dominant narratives, ideologies, and policies through the process of knowledge production, that the value of knowledge isn't just knowledge creation in itself, but that it's a utility to advance racial justice and social change. In my own research, I really appreciated what um, Torre calls this contact space and this idea of nosotras, uh, critiquing that binary of the us versus them, rather these spaces where we're both and. So I can speak to my own experience, again, with intergroup dialogue and youth participatory action research, really problematizing our positionalities in relationship to one another through the research process. So again, centering those participatory and relational ways of doing research. Thank you, next slide. Let me just try to summarize the next two slides because their next two slides basically are in keeping with our question and our issue of, you know, how do we make this continue? How do we make this uh, relationship between values and theoretical alignment? How do we keep that there? And what we're offering, obviously, in our in our panel and other staff as well, is that there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between the dominant narrative and the dominant culture and the ways of knowing and the way it's woven into our educational systems, and the and and the the intentions of the so, of social work values and our commitment to anti-racism, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I'm just going to summarize some of these points in the last slide so that we can get to the, in the interest of time, is we are talking about the ways to which uh, we elevate collective learning and experiential learning, uh, that we reframe the whole question of, of research from focusing so much on objectively oriented research, which is really the holding to a gold standard of the empirical process and reframing it in terms of the interests of the community and action-oriented processes, elevating Chicana and Latinx uh, feminist content, I think is particularly important. We also, if we move to the next slide, we can emphasize the, the notion of uh, embodied knowledge, experience, ancestral wisdom and narrative as, as legitimate ways of knowing. Um, that that really um, move beyond the privileged knowledge that's generated by the rigid guidelines of empirical method the methods. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that we don't re, um, embrace evidence-based practices, but I think we kind of think of evidence-based practices as the apex of knowledge, and maybe we think about it now in terms of a place to begin to ask questions as a place to, as opposed to a place of, you know, of conclusion or ending, but, uh, but letting it instruct us, but also let our other act, let these other forms of knowledge instruct us as well. And, and also as Adriana has already pointed out, the emphasis on collective action and advocacy is really quintessentially social work folks. It's macro, it's micro, meso, and macro practice. Next slide. Please. So I think Susan, who was our person, got kicked out. Can we have someone else pull up the slides for us? If not, we can conclude because we were getting to the conclusion. I think for me, some final remarks in regards to lat crit. We were focusing specifically on the ways that it can expand or you know, highlight ways that we can integrate both intersectionality and differential racialization within social work, ways of knowing and teaching and practice. Part of that for me, I think the strengths is, it's not just valuable for working with Latinx communities. It really gives us a better sense of the various ways that racism, colonialism, sexism, 
really are intersecting to create structures of oppression, not only for our clients, ourselves, and our students. So for me, one of the strengths of it is this kind of examination of the erasure of Black, Indigenous, and Asian racial identity, even within the Latinx community. And we go to the final slide, and then we can um, end. So no, sorry, go back to slide seven, 16. Thank you. Um, the other piece that I just want to highlight from here is that decentering whiteness while unpacking colorism and white privilege doesn't mean we don't talk about whiteness or that we're removing all of the white experience in the US. I think that that's often um, a false critique of critical race theory or lack crit. Really what we're trying to do is address the erasure of indigeneity in black diaspora by being critically self-reflective also of the ways that we internalize white supremacy and privilege, even within communities of color and specifically for the Latinx community that is multiracial and heterogeneous. And then finally, LatCrit really, again, helps us think through how to advance scholarship and knowledge production that is anti-subordination and participatory and looking to create social change. Thank you. And sorry for all the tech issues. I believe the next slide has our contact information as well as a way to join the Critical Race Scholars in Social Work Network, which we invite you all to do. Thank you all. Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, in the interest of time, that was just such a rich presentation and so much to think about in terms of our, our epistemological challenges. And, and one thing I thought about was if, if there's different bars to meet in terms of like what is successful social work scholarship and teaching, we would all be doing things differently, right? So the unspoken scaffolding of whiteness and white perspectives and white social scientists is what makes people successful mm -hmm. in terms of the metrics that we're, you know, that we're currently using. Um, this was just, uh, it was challenging, it was invigorating. I'm gonna rewatch all of these, uh, these videos. What I want to bring back folks from all the panels um, and spend a few minutes doing some audience questions and we might go over time about five minutes if that's okay. All right. Um, so this first question um, I'm going to pose to our first paper. How can schools of social work work to provide the spaces for healing, repair and reconciliation and consciousness raising so as to help prevent further harm? I think, I think I'm to offer some thoughts and I think maybe it's because of the pandemic and the sense of relentless work that went from shifting to remote instruction and just remote everything. Um, while other folk were experiencing a kind of slower pace or some people lost their jobs. But I feel like in academia, what this year showed me is that we don't have room for anything other than being quote unquote productive. And we don't see healing, repair, reconciliation or time to breathe as necessary and important. So as long as we are buying into capitalism within a neoliberal higher academic, you know, higher ed framework, we won't have an honored spaces for healing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? Um, yeah, we yeah. Can, uh, I'll let Chris start because I think this was uh, tied to some of the concepts we talked about. Yeah. And so the thing I, th I think about is like just the idea of space in general and, and like what does it mean to do work like this and in those in our own spaces? And how do we how do we can I guess one the first place we have to start with is like how do we conceptualize doing work like this for ourselves? Mm -hmm. And then once we figure out how how that kind of works for us, like how do we communicate that and integrate that into the work that we're already doing and, and bringing other people into that space and into that work as well. 
Um, specifically in social work uh, schools, one of the things we have to think about is why uh, do we do things the way we do? And how can we construct ways of doing things differently? There's this push, I loved um, the comment about quality, uh, quantity over quality, and I wrote down, we need to have quality over quantity. And that might mean that our outcomes look different. Um, mm -hmm. the, the schools are this very like, check off the boxes. You did this, you, met, you, you hit this benchmark. But what if we created space in our classrooms to they create what the benchmarks are, right? So that's something specifically that could be done in the classroom to just create space. How do we create classrooms where we, where the experiences and the cultures and the identities that are brought to the classroom are the asset and the starting place versus us dumping? And there were lots of other really good examples mm -hmm. in the other presentations. I loved how Dr. Perez talked about diversity managers. How do we fight against that push? Because that's mm -hmm. what social work has been, mm -hmm. but it's not what it should be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm gonna move us to the next question. Um, and uh, let's, let's start with this one. For social workers committed to reparations, how do we hold ourselves accountable in our daily practice as students and faculty members and what should we be doing every day. Um, so a uh, paper one or two, um, Ebony, maybe you have some thoughts? Um, thank you, Dr. Abrams. I do, and I smiled um, because I think reparations can mean a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, people often think of financial reparations and absolutely there is a time and a place and, the, and a way that that can look, um, you know, from like free college tuition and, but that's a whole nother Oprah show, so I won't go there. But how we can talk about, I think this feeds into that idea of bringing in healing and bringing in joy and bringing in community because reparations also means that I am pouring into you and respecting you and your humanity and your ability and what you bring to the table and into my classroom. And if the table doesn't fit, then let's start over. Let's create something beautiful and different together. I think, um, as Adriana stated, this year has been an opportunity for growth. And some of us have taken that opportunity to really do a lot of introspection, self-reflection, and think about ways that we can do things differently, and even using these new platforms that we've come into. So when we think of reparations, my thing would be, how is it that you and your community that you're working with are defining reparations? So that would be first, we need to come from a common place. Mm -hmm. And then holding yourself accountable to that definition is going to look different depending on the community that you live, work and serve in. And that is going to determine for what you need to be doing each day. So for me in the space that I work in, I'm, at, I'm in rural Florida, aren't a lot of many like black and brown folks in my neighborhood, in fact, for three years, I was the only person of color really in my neighborhood, which was interesting, um, myself and my children. So what I look at is in my academic spaces where our student body is extremely diverse, our faculty is not. Mm -hmm. And so what do I do to hold myself accountable is I make myself available for students and faculty and staff who may be struggling or who may have dealt had to deal with instances of oppression or racism that they come into co contact with on campus. So I think it's going to look very different depending on where we all are, but opening your mind and being committed to doing something is a starting place. And then as Dr. Nakaoka, I always mess up your name, Susan, I'm sorry. As she talked about with the Chris Dub Network, I think finding your tribe is important to the work that you should be doing each day because racial battle fatigue is for real. Um, it, this work, whether you identify as black, white, 
Latinx, indigenous, whatever your identification is, when you engage in critical work, it is tiring. It mm -hmm. is, your family doesn't understand because they don't do the work unless you're married to another academic. Mm -hmm. So finding your tribe helps you do this thing each day because you've got to take care of yourself and social workers are horrible at self-care. Don't know why that is, but we've got to do a better job at, as um, Adriana taught me last year, taking a nap. Like what is that moment to recharge and rest? And those are the things that I think we need to be doing each day as well is taking care of ourselves. And I wonder, uh, yeah. Oh. Well, we have one minute, but and I but I want to bring just follow up really quick. You've all found each other in this network, and then you ended up on this panel together. So um, that you know, random, not randomly, but kind of. Um, so I guess one quick, one more minute, and and quick follow up is that this this is happening. So how? How did you all find each other for this support? And could we, you know, emulate that in some way? I don't know if Anna, if you want to speak to that or, or someone else. Um. I, <laughs> Susan? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Larry and I, for me, it was Larry who brought CRT to Dominguez Hills back in 2006. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dominguez is the first MSW program centering CRT. Um, but it was also my background and, and ability to be educated at UCLA that has such a rich CRT, both in education and legal realm network. So then I met other folks that, and we got together, we presented at CSWE a few times and met um, even more folks. And then just to start, kept talking about that we needed to get together. So I think that's kind of how loosely it started. It, Adriana's now at, at Dominguez Hills and Ebony and Anna met us through the CSWE kind of convenings mm -hmm. and, and connections. Mm -hmm. okay, so but supporting, I mean, at UCLA, it was a student run class, mm -hmm. you know, CRT and public affairs. And it was students who, and as a doc student who created that or my experience there as a grad student in ethnic studies and so, a dual program in ethnic studies and social work, which really mm -hmm. fuels me and, and made me amenable to Larry saying CRT um, and from an ethnic studies perspective, that was exactly my niche. So supporting those student-run initiatives, dual programs, collaboration with ethnic studies and, and other f disciplines, I think are really important. And, and I would say- If I can just add, you know, Susan's, uh, Susan's experience as a uh, community organizer really has not hurt any. <laughs> it's been very helpful because a lot of what just has happened in the last couple of years uh, with, with with the formal organization of, of critical race scholars is is really Susan's uh, you know, ideas and, uh, and and coming together and we've done some work uh, you know at, at conferences and but what we had over 200 people at their at our virtual concert uh, a conference this past fall I mean it's basic community org sort of stuff um, that it reaches out in and uh, keeping the tent wide, you know, I mean, you know, the, um, the, the, the you know, uh, but yet also focused at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, last comments under 30 seconds. Sorry, we're gonna have to wrap up soon. Thank you so much. I was just gonna say that as a person who is in rural Florida, um, finding other scholars who were doing critical work and race-based work was integral and has been and continues to be to my growth and process. So I didn't have the experience that Susan had and I'm grateful and honored that she has chosen to share her gifts um, and I'm gleaning all I can. <laughs> Uh, and a shout out to you, Laura. You were the faculty advisor for that student supported <laughs> CRT class at UCLA, right? So having supporting those as faculty are super important. Thank you for that. Well, this has just been, um, I mean, we could talk, I could talk for another hour, but I know <laughs> <laughs> we are over time. Um, I'm really hoping we can find ways to continue all of these conversations through the networks we have and building more, which I think we're starting to with um, different special interest groups at SWER and some of the things happening through NASW and CSWE and the Critical Race Scholars Group. So I just want to give a shout out to that. 
and also last night's presentation from the um, a doctoral student group uh, working on integrating um, the voices of BIPOC and anti-racist uh, voices into doctoral education, which really will also help determine the future. So today we considered a lot about epistemology, um, our ways of knowing, teaching, thinking, researching, publishing. It gave it gave us so much to um, to ponder, and we will be back tomorrow morning. Same time, 9.30 a.m., our clock here on the <laughs> West Coast. Um, and uh, I hope to see you there. And I really appreciate all of you. I have learned so much from all of you. And I look forward to reading your work in the future as well. Thank you. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, again, everybody. <laughs>